We're going to say good morning, everyone that I haven't spoken to already. Um, Superintendent Andrew is on his way. I'm going to go ahead and for the sake of time, since Ms. Peck says he's on his way, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Mr. Cowles is at the lectern, and I will turn it over just for context for, for your information. I want to change our um, agenda a little bit today, and we're going to have our ABC report from our curriculum staff, and we're going to um, do restorative justice too, and then we're, we'll come back and end um, with our custodial report, okay? So Mr. Cowles and Mr. Gilfillan. Oh, you're sitting. Okay, I thought he was doing it since he was standing, but he's gonna advance. We gotta get a clicker. Yeah, well, we're trying to save money. Yeah. I'm gonna, I, I, you know what, I, has, I still have some of my 50th birthday money. I'm gonna buy a clicker. I've been saying I'm gonna buy it all these years. I don't know if it has the plug in now. Either way, Mr. Cowles is a man of many talents, one of them being um, a fantastic um, ability to press buttons. So, um, well, good morning, board. Um, as you know, my name is Taylor Gilfillan, Director of Data Analytics, Evaluation, and Accountability. I am joined by my, uh, one of my favorite partners in crimes, Ms. Jenny Wise, Chief of Teaching and Learning. Um, we're here to share the ABC scorecard and report. Um, it is March 8th, so the data we're looking at is from February. Um, we, we can't um, forecast just yet into the future, so we're, we're focusing on what's just right behind us. What we're going to cover today are some of the updates in both the scorecard. Um, the, just the biggest thing, if you haven't already noticed from the, from the beautiful um, legal-sized packet in front of you, is we have core academic updates from FAST PM2 for grades 3 through 10. That's going to be the highlight and most of what we talk about today. Ms. Wise is going to talk about how we've been using um, the ABCs to align our support um, with all of our instructional support team, which you'll get a chance to share more about. Um, so that's what we'd like to share with you and, and seek uh, both your questions and feedback this morning. Click one more time, Prescott. So that's what I just shared there. One more, Prescott. So <clears throat> what I'd invite your eyes to, to look up at on the screen is when we're looking at FAST PM1 to PM2, there's two main things we can be talking about. Um, we're very interested, obviously, in achievement, which is where our kids are right now. We're also probably very interested in the growth they're making, right? So both our kids learning and our kids growing. So that's going to be two of the things we look at today. There's going to be two different numbers that we're looking at today that I want to be able to share and say a little bit more about. I think both are important. I don't necessarily think either is right or wrong, but I want you as the board to be equipped and the community to be equipped to how we talk about and think about these two numbers. So... Two things you're going to see today, um, you're, you're literally going to see the two same reports. There's, it's almost like just two of the same report. The only difference is they use different measures of achievement. So on one set you'll see we're going to use the very familiar level three or higher. So it's familiar for families, it's familiar for teachers who have been in Florida and staff. That's the kids who are reaching that level of proficiency. Um, the other one that we also included, though, that is a little bit more of where we think kids are going to be is the 41st percentile or higher. And that's literally after PM2, the state, you know, lines up all of the test scores and informs us basically how many kids were above that 41st percentile. And the significance of that is the state's basically committed to us. That's what they think is going to line up to be a, a three in May. So what I present for you today is both a look at where kids are at today, like how many kids are at a three, and also a look at how many kids do we think are going to be at a three in May when we look at the 41st percentile. Um, just a quick summary there. Again, just how I would explain that to you is one's looking at the now, one's looking at kind of the projection in the future. So level three is the now. How many kids right now, based on PM2, are reading on grade level or considered on grade level for math, and one is, based on where they're at right now, how do we think they're going to land up by the end of the year? Um, so again, those are going to be the two numbers we look at. It's the exact same data twice, just in these two different formats. Dr. Rockwell, yes, ma'am. When you talk about the 41st percentile, is that where they're going to set the criterion for a level three, or is that an estimate? It's a little bit of both. So what they've basically said is they're, we're using actually the cut scores for what's a level three. We're actually using per the state, and that's what they're giving us, is the cut scores from last year's FSA. 
So to our best understanding, the 41st percentile is gonna be kind of the starting point for what they might look like as a three, because the, that was basically the cut source last year that they used for how many threes and above there were last year. Um, so it, I guess as, as an educator, I'm trying to wrap my head around this, and I know you are not decision makers in this, this comes from the state, but if we're looking at students' proficiency on the curriculum, a curriculum-based assessment, the criterion should be set regardless of percentile ranking. So if a district was truly effective, 90% of their students would be level three and above. We should not be setting criterion based on percentile ranking because that automatically means that 40% of the students in the state of Florida fail. And so it's not possible for the state of Florida to be more proficient than that. Um, so I'm just putting that on the record. I know you have no control over it, but it is a meaningless measure at that point. I completely agree, Dr. Rockwell. And just again, to kind of reiterate what she's saying, right, and this is how Florida's done it in the past, is they say we're going to have 59% of our schools be A and B, so we're gonna look at all the data and then draw the lines to ensure that's true. So completely. Right, and so that is, that's the work that they get to do with this test. Um, they actually haven't told us what the criteria is gonna be for this upcoming year, so the best we know can, for right now is because of how we know they look at the data and draw the lines, we know that if we're looking at having our kids be above that 41st percentile, we think that's what's gonna track to be proficient for this coming year. Um, but your points are well noted. Um, so I'll just tell you, I'll show you two quick examples here. Um, you're gonna see graphs that look like they show growth and some that don't look like they show. So for example, um, this is showing you for ELA and math, these are the different courses. And I believe if you wanna see a closer up version of this, you can find this particular one. I'm gonna look over on my teammates. <laughs> Man, she's quick on the draw. Oh, wait, I think I see the back of it. 48, did you say? Yes, 48. It's page 48. Yep. So if you want to turn to page 48, just I don't want you to be squinting at the screen up here. Um, so this is an example, too, that if we're looking at level three, um, it's, I hope we would all expect to see that there would be growth from PM1 to PM2. Um, they've Kids have had almost uh, a half year's worth more of instruction. So when you look at by course and by grade level, you'll see that we are having more kids reach that proficiency mark. Um, what's not super clear when we look at this, and again, as, as a team, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about the 41st percentile is we, would knew, we knew we would be in this moment right now, which is that it's PM2, the lines are going up, um, but how do we know what's like, how do we kind of keep ourselves on par with the state? Um, so you might look at this and say, okay, our kids are growing, but like, Everyone else in the state of Florida is taking this test. How are, we, how are they growing? How are we growing relative to them? So if you look at the next slide, that same information now is captured, um, and I'm gonna phone a friend here on where to, you're gonna see the exact same data just with the different measure of 41st percentile. It should be closer to the front. And board members, if you spot it before we do, please let me know. You're getting warmer. Oh, I got to discipline. You went too far. This is page 37. Yes, correct. You're the winner. Good job. <laughs> so, yep. so, same information, but what this is showing me when I look at it is not that our kids aren't growing. We saw for the level threes that they are increasing. What this does show though is that on PM2, we had fewer students above that 41st percentile than we did on PM1, right? So it's the same idea that we're growing. I don't know the exact way I would, I think, phrase it. It's something along the lines of that kids in other districts or kids not in Alachua County maybe grew just a little bit more. I mean, if you look at the data table, you'll see for most it's a few percentage points drops, but I think that's kind of our baseline setting of like, you know, yes, there was growth and we wanna still be tracking what we think is gonna be our goal at the end of the year, which is how many kids are at that 41st percentile or higher. Um, so 
I'm sure you have plenty of questions. I think what I'd like to just kind of zoom out and say is we're talking about the same students. We're talking about the same courses. The reason why we're presenting it is I think just showing either one by itself could be misleading. Um, we know obviously our kids are going to grow, but are we on track to meet our targets? And when you look at this, well, it's, are our kids growing? Yes, of course they do. Teachers are working with them every day. Um, but relative to the state, right, it's a little bit different. So um, what I present to you and the board and the community is we have both of these numbers. I'm not positing that I think one is better than the other. I think just both are kind of important pieces to keep in mind when we're talking about achievement and growth. Um, and if you'll, you'll, as you get a chance to read through and, and um, if you don't have questions that you can think of today, but think of them as we move forward, um, please reach out. Hopefully, though, we get to have a better conversations about um, where we are tracking towards our, our, you know, our goals, but then also what are we doing today to make sure that we're supporting our, our students and teachers across the district. So is page 37, is that the state data? Or is that Alachua County on 37? Thank you for the opportunity to clarify that because I don't think I made that explicitly clear. This is Alachua County Alachua data. County, okay. Um, but this is the percent of kids who are above that 41st percentile or higher. So I Prescott, if okay. you're by the stand, if you want to click back just a couple of slides. Oh, I have it. Um, oh, we're fancy. Mm. Prescott, your job has been replaced. Um, go back one, yes, so here basically that, f that percentile is generated for all the kids who took that test for PM2. We don't actually get that until two weeks after the test. So the number of our kids in Alachua County that are in that blue box for the state went slightly down in most of our courses. Thanks. Um, here, let's click ahead. Um, so I know there's plenty on the table in front of you to digest. Um, I'm happy to create a space for that now. And then the only last thing to just a visual color code, I know we're looking at the same data. Um, the tables and visuals that use the red to blue color scale, that's the 41st percentile. Um, your traditional stoplight um, red to green is for the level three, the more familiar um, levels one through five that we're used to discussing when it comes to state testing. So just visually, if you're not sure what data you're looking at, you can just reference back to that, two different color scales for the two measures. Um, Dr. Ockel, yes ma'am. Um, it might be in here and I didn't see it, but do we have the percent of students from last year's FSA who were at the 41st percentile and at level three so that we can just make a comparison from last year to this year. So just to repeat, just to make sure I understood you correctly, in other words, for kids who were at a one last year, how are they doing this year? How many, of, how many of them are above the 41st percentile? Was that, did I hear you correctly? I wasn't asking about students who were at a one. I was asking for a comparison of these exact measures, how many were at a level three in each grade level and how many were at the 41st percentile in each grade level so we can see if we're doing better, worse, the same as last year. Got it. Since we have a new test, it's, it's hard to compare. Yes, thank you for the, thank you for the clarification. Um, we did not receive percentiles last year. That's a new measure that we're looking at this year. Um, we would be able to do a level three comparison. The, my only thinking would be we could compare May's, last year's May level threes to this year's January level threes. I don't think it would be quite apples to apples. I'm sure it would look like we have lots more room to go um, grow. But I think what I do hear you so those just what are our opportunities for either historical comparison or knowing whether we're on track compared to last year. Is that the understood? Um, I was, I was actually going to say, Ms. Certain, we, we, we have kind of a second part we'd like to share. I'd like to defer to you, though, if you'd like to kind of stop here and either ask questions or have discussion regarding let, the data. Let me um, ask if I have one question, but I want to see if, it, if Dr. McNeil, do you have, any, have a question or anything? Um, I, I, I probably will have one. Okay. Um, thinking about what you said about the kids who have already received the letters, the parents have already received the January third grade samples. Yeah. Okay. I think you had a couple of pages showing um, your SI or your third grade level schools. I'd like to take a look at that. So 
there's a, a couple different pages you might want to look at. Yes, so if you're looking just as a whole, um, for example, page 31 looks at um, grade level by subject. So for example, I see we have 55% of our students in third grade at the 41st percentile or higher for ELA. So on track, we think to, to be at a three or higher by the end of the year, and that's page 31. Um, if you'd okay. like to see school specific, yes. on page 34, um, page 34 is the school specific by subject and grade level um, for 41st percentile. And then the corresponding, if you want to see the same data, but in terms of level three, that would be on page 45. So school specific data would be on starting on page 34 and then also on page 45. Thank you. You don't have anything? Okay. Um, I guess my question was, is um, this comparison? So we have a new test and new standards, and I'm wondering if, I, I guess you could make a comparison to say the third graders that were from last year, they're now in fourth grade, and you would make a comparison of our to see if the fourth graders are on pace, but we don't really, like how would we make a comparison between year between in students and how they're doing proficiency? I, 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 I think, so you just summarized a, a good number of the difficulties. I think something that we could potentially look at, and, and this is kind of a marriage of that, is for our third graders who didn't see as much success as they wanted to last year, how are they doing this year? So the kids mm -hmm. who needed the most support at the end of the year, how are they proceeding this year? Do we know their names? Are we supporting them in our schools? Um, I think that's probably the, the closest we'd be able to come to, but you're right, it, it is tough to compare across years. When we change the test, we change the standards, and we're testing more frequently than we were last year. Okay. Um, maybe hang here. Just any other, I guess, questions or wondering from boards about the data before we switch into, and I'm gonna pass it over to Ms. Wise to talk about some of the work we're doing with staff around the ABC goals as well. Um, I don't have anything else. Did you, um, does Mr. Dr. Rockwell? Okay, so go ahead. Do you have something else? All right. So thank you for that. Um, it's great that uh, Taylor and his team is providing for us the scorecard and the report and all of the information in Tableau. But if we're not doing something and taking action with it, then that's a lot of work that they're doing. Um, for nothing, and so I wanted to try to give you some updates about what we're doing in response to the data, and more specifically, in response to the, the number of students who are not on track to look like they will be proficient by the end of the year. Um, our curriculum specialists use the information that we get, not just from progress monitoring, because in the, the PM, the progress monitoring test the standards are clustered, so it's more difficult for us to pull out exactly what type of intervention the students need. So we have other progress monitoring tools that we use for that. And then the curriculum specialists provide to the teachers by grade level, by standard, based on how proficient our students were on it, uh, reteach support materials and resources. Uh, we are additionally, after spring break, opening some new face-to-face -face or uh, beyond-the-bell opportunities, specifically in math, where um, we're noticing that our students are really struggling in some of the areas that we have struggled mightily for some time, specifically seventh grade math, ninth grade algebra one. So we're working on um, providing resources for schools to use specifically with the students who are not on track to be proficient. Um, what we also want to do work on specifically between now and state assessment is aligning the way we're using our instructional support team to support schools and teachers. And so we uh, had a meeting with them last week, but prior to that meeting, we surveyed them around, well, that's really, really tiny. <laughs> is that on here somewhere? I don't think it is in your packet. So um, we surveyed them based on uh, wanting to know what their understanding of the ABC goals were and their school improvement goals for the schools. I'm sorry, is that in the packet? No, ma'am. Oh. But the slide deck can be provided to you. Okay. 
So um, we surveyed the instructional support team members, which are curriculum specialists, literacy implementation specialists, math implementation specialists, mentor coaches, um, professional development specialists, um, Title I support teachers, uh, support personnel from ESE and student services, and bringing them all together, wanting to understand, do they know what our ABC goals are, are the school improvement goals for the schools they support, and how we're tracking towards those goals so that they're uh, aware of how to leverage the support they offer schools. So the questions we ask them, how familiar are you with these things? Do you understand the way your team supports these things? Do you understand the way that your team and other teams support this so that you know clearly what your role is in terms of supporting teachers and schools? And what we noticed on these itty bitty uh, font is that um, some of the things highlighted in red that uh, were a lower response rate than we wanted was understanding the way other departments work aligned to supporting the ABC and SIP goals, school improvement plan goals, and also where to find the ABC scorecard information um, and knowing the way um, their work and uh, supported. I can't even read that, Taylor. You're going to really have to help me there. Um, you got it. Yeah. yeah so. so we wanted to know that ahead of time what to target. And so we set very clearly um, our path, our meeting goals, when we brought them together in the beautiful space um, of the Cotton Club, which was the first time I had been there. I did not know that this space was available for meeting. Um, they had a beautiful exhibit there that part of our morning warm up um, with teammates was to. Uh, view and respond to the exhibit and I think like Mrs. Certain has said African American history is American history and even though this meeting fell on the last day of February this was a reminder to all of our instructional support team members that we are going to continue to infuse um, this material throughout <coughs> all of the content areas as we finish the school year so just a brief shout out to that space um, it was fantastic. But the, our meeting goals were to understand individually in their teams and collectively as teams who support schools, how their roles align to support that work. And um, specifically within their teams to identify what things they should uh, start, stop, and um, change about the way they were doing their work. And it was really important for us to hear from them because when you think about having a, a team of about 50 people supporting 2,000 teachers and as many students as we have not at proficiency, we have to be very targeted and intentional with the work that they do. They have to know what each other are doing so they're not overwhelmed with the enormity of supporting such a large number of novice teachers who haven't come from teacher preparation programs and teaching in difficult conditions, um, it's important that their work is aligned and that they know what they're each responsible for. So they had the opportunity to work in role alike and enroll different groups to really understand um, and help us understand what needs to be most clear in the way we direct and support their work. Um, and we got a lot of good feedback and, you know, not knowing, for instance, that they didn't have access to teacher's additions for areas that they support. Some things that are really easy fixes and some things that are a lot more complicated, like um, literally not having enough time in the day or in the week to support the number of teachers uh, that need their help uh, with lesson planning, direct instruction, uh, using data to plan for intervention and support. Those are some pretty complex, high-level teaching uh, activities that our, our teachers need a lot of help with. So we got a lot of good feedback from them. Um, they interacted with each other around some specific questions we had about how we as district leaders could communicate with them and align their support and really listened to them about uh, where they felt their time was most impactful and where they were seeing uh, how their work was uh, affecting students and teachers. And um, on their, their post survey in those two areas about really knowing where to find the information in terms of the ABC scorecard or SIP goals and then understanding what their role and the role of other departments was um, just in that one day was a tremendous change. So we feel like the 
four hours that we spent with them that morning, even though they weren't in the schools for those four hours was well spent. And we continue, we're going to follow up with them. We've identified some work groups uh, that we want to have moving forward to continue to refine the work that they're doing supporting our schools. Um, we have for some time emphasized with these instructional support team members the need to have a common language of what quality instruction looks like and specifically this year we want them to understand the shared goals in the ABC report and also to know those areas of the core that we're emphasizing this year um, core principle one which is a supportive school environment and core principle two which is standards aligned instruction and so understanding no matter what department or what work they're doing that they're using the language of those two core principles to support quality Mrs. instruction. Wise. Yes ma'am. Um, this is wonderful that you had the Graders. So around identifying how to support our students who aren't becoming proficient? Everything that you did with the team. Sure. When did you do that or when will you do that with the administrators? So our work around the ABC report and the core has been ongoing in our principal meetings. But the work that we, what we learned specifically from this meeting, Dr. McNeely, about how to better utilize our instructional support team, how to be more clear about what their roles are, and even really how to deploy them in a way where they are um, teamed and supporting the same group of schools and then providing opportunity and space for them to get to together and collaborate, like if you're supporting exclusively SI schools or if you're ex supporting specifically just high schools and Algebra 1, for instance, or ELA 10th grade, what can they do as teams? Um, that is something moving forward that we'll be sharing with our principals so that they understand and, and really we're um, formalizing the guide of the work that the instructional support team does because I think some of our administrators maybe don't know don't. Who, to, who to call specifically when they see a s teacher struggling with fill in the blank whether it's classroom management or understanding the depth of the standard that's how it's going to be assessed and how they get their students to grapple with work at that level of rigor maybe they don't know who to call and so we're putting together an instructional support team guide so that they'll have all of that by team by team member and then very clearly list what is the role of that team member and that's in progress right now we'll share that with you as we share it with the administrators thank you and so now we uh, would like your questions and feedback I just have one question um, as well. so during the summer are we working with administrators and teachers so they understand all of this so we are and how often during the summer throughout the summer what are we doing before school starts so that they can make sure they understand. So we are getting together department leads to talk about summer professional development, the professional development days to make sure that those are high impact um, and used uh, very well, uh, as well as the year-long PD plan for the 23-24 school year. So. Um, I would think before the end of the school year, probably May, we should be able to bring what that plan looks like for you for summer professional development around all of these topics, around um, behavior, core instruction, uh, universal design for learning, supporting the needs of diverse learners, all of that we should be able to bring to you soon. But that involves departments other than mine. It involves the professional development department and the ESE and student services division so I won't speak to that individually. I'll want that impact or that input from the rest of the team leads and we will bring that to you. I guess my question is not really directed at you. I, I got a couple for you, but I guess I'll start with you. Um, actually, you just answered it because I was wondering, I'm glad the training was held on the 17th. 28th with the ISTs? 28th, okay, 28th. I saw 217 up there. I know I'm not losing it. That was the pre survey? You're not, yeah, that that's was, when they did the pre survey. Okay, I know, that's why 217. Okay, so 
I'm glad that 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 was good. I guess that you did a pre-survey or whatever, and that you all got together on February 28th. But in my eyes, that should have happened yeah, cool. beginning of the school year, because um, when I was I went back in this ABC report I'm glad that we have it and I think it is the reason I um, one of the reasons that I was really I kind of asked for us to have this in this data to be shared with the board is because I, for the two years I went to SI meetings this is data that we review and so I felt it was really good to have this kind of before us and when it was first presented to us on October 18th um, Superintendent Andrew you told us that you guys would present data in the workshops, and you would come with some actions that are being taking, taken, what's working and what's not working. And you welcome public input and from the parents, and you know, input from the public and the parents. And so we're here from October, like five months, and we had two principals to come, and they kind of shared how they were using it. But I guess what I'm concerned about is that I saw those those numbers up there, and um, those are for the folks who are supporting our novice teachers. But I'm not I'm not sure that all the leaders, the school leaders, are using this data because I don't have any evidence that we're being um, that's coming to the board. That's yeah. So this is directed at the superintendent. This is not directed at the staff because in in the deputy because I just I think that um, probably going forward it is really good to have information because the data is what we need to be looking at to make decisions. But I'm just wondering, like, um, you know, what are the actions being taken? Have we, you know, what's working? What's not working? Um, we made a made a change last week. Um, to move some staffing into the classroom. And I want to know, I, I asked for a plan and some update on that, but I'm wondering what are, the, what are we going to be looking at to know if that was the right move to make? And if that was the, um, how are we going to go forward with evaluating? Is that going to be the plan of action and come August or September when we're not fully staffed? Are we going to make that decision, pull the trigger earlier? to move staff into classrooms so that we can impact that. Because right now we only have probably nine, 10 weeks of school left. I don't know. So are the TSAs in the classroom now? Did they start Monday or will they start after spring break? That's my first question. So with the TSAs, what we did was we sought volunteers and um, we explained the need to them. Uh, the volunteers, we did not actually place a TSA in a classroom full time. What we did was we looked at, did a deep dive, and we we dove into it with Miss um, Jones, Miss Wise, Miss Roll, Miss Dell, and Miss Leinenbach, and we looked at specific schedules and specific needs at classrooms. We surveyed the principals and got feedback, and they narrowed a list down to roughly ten areas that were of uh, immediate need for them in other areas. They were uh, comfortable with the support they were providing long-term subs and others in those classrooms. And so what we did is we, we looked at those 10 identified needs on the uh, information we collected from the principals, and we looked at how we were leaning in with multiple um, teachers that are out there in curriculum areas like reading, math, we also adjusted how and where administrators were leaning in to provide support. And so, but as far as a reassignment of a TSA to take over a classroom for the remainder of the year, that did not occur. When we did that, that was back in August, when we, um, I believe it was four or five that we had at Alachua Elementary, two are still teaching out there full time. Uh, they came out of the student services ESE area. And there, there's, so there's two, folks still at Alacha Elementary teaching, they might be fifth grade, um, if I'm not mistaken. But nonetheless, uh, those were the only ones that were placed this year at the start of the school year. And they've, like I said, two have remained and others, uh, the other two or three are back doing their specific job duties. So 
Um, no one has been reassigned for the remainder of the school year to a classroom. We looked at, like I said, as a team, the intensive supports and what was needed where. We also looked at the PM1 to PM2 data. Our SI turnaround principles were looking at that closely, and we made some adjustments um, to where coaches are and what their schedules are, as Ms. Wise said, looking at deployment and readjusted how they were deployed. So they're spending more time um, at those particular schools, the SI schools is what I'm hearing you saying. Yes, on that list where the 10 areas of concern were, that's, um, I, I think, five or six of them we were able to address. Some are just as, as recently as a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, some a vacancy just occurred. Um, you know, the teacher left, and so some of those were not addressable at this time. Okay, so I guess going forward, when we, the next couple months uh, that we have remaining in school and this report comes to us, I think we have to not just have the data, we have to really know what actions are being taken. And we can't, there's too many schools to bring into one workshop, but maybe if we're looking, uh, not just to focus just on our SI schools, but we have issues in the other schools, and it may be one SI and one other school, you know, at the elementary level, the middle school level, and high school. But I think, you know, we really need to have the, the type of evaluation of our actions and the things that we're doing to see if they're um, yielding um, results as it pertains to our students, you know, good results and not wait till like this time of the year to, to do this type of work and what we just did. It was good that it was done. I just think the timing of it was a tad bit off. I think this should have been um, um, rolled out in the fall sometime. We're, the core, I think everybody heard about the core but knows about that because that was part of the summer pre PD from last year. But the ABC report, it seems that there was some disconnect and I think um, I have heard that you've done this training with the in the principals meeting. I've heard that before, but it seems if everyone knowing where the data is, why it should be used, how it could be used, what actions and what states, you know, steps that you're taking, I just think it's just too reactionary, and that's a little bit concerning, you know, at this point in the year. Yes, ma'am. So I, I don't disagree with you, and and previously we did get this group we had another name for them, the coaching captains, together um, really quarterly or more often. Um, so moving forward, we will. Um, organizationally, there's a lot of uh, different leaders um, over the different instructional support team members, and um, maybe that contributed to the challenge, but I am going to own that and moving forward ensure that they are together early and often and know very clearly what their work is. Uh, let, me, let me say this. Um, that's why I asked because some teachers are saying they would like to spend more time on really understanding before school starts. August 10th, we want them hitting the ground running so that they know where to adjust. And best practices, I guess, in your um, principal meetings and things of that nature, like I'm, I'm just using Idlewild for an example. Uh, when I look at, you know, Mr. Kuhn and his staff, uh, they're making strides. And so how do we get everybody going in that same direction? So do we spend time in the principal meetings, if it's elementary, who's strong in middle school, who's strong? Uh, have we looked at uh, other schools that may be really getting this down? It's not because we want to make sure all of our children are doing well because what I'm what I'm looking for, the results and how do you adjust? Because I know back in the past, uh, when I used to tutor at schools years ago, people knew how to adjust in the middle of the year and say, okay, well this is not working because I mean we got a pattern of things still coming out the same and we keep continuing to have these meetings, but we got to be able to move and see the results that we need academic because we we don't want to have seven, uh, you know. Uh, SI schools, and then you have those uh, categories I'm worried about in all our schools with kids with disabilities and those minority students who are still struggling as well. So really, you know, we need to look at how and who best knows how to do that, and you pull those people together, put
pull out your teachers or administrators, but even in your principal's meeting, we got to get to the point to say, okay, if we put this up here, here's how you really move and transition uh, in, in better use of time. But, but we got to get to the point where we can have some results. Thank you. The silos, like it sounds like they're from what I got PD over here and curriculum over here. So I'm, I'm in the two aren't like really communicating and that's really a challenge presents challenges that's in negative challenges that's impacting our students negatively. Right. So we got to um, there's a lady um, do what do what's right and best for kids and really come come along so we could serve them. So Ms. Abbott, you have something you have to say? Uh, Mr. Andrew, this is, this is to you. So you ask principals about the support they need, and they say they feel supported, and they have enough support, but 16% of the fourth graders at Rawlings are, are, are proficient. But based on this, I, I am, I am I can, I'm about to jump out of my chair. I am so upset about this. I mean, how long are we going to sit and look at these red numbers and SI schools, and you know what? You don't ask who would like to move, who would volunteer. You make those assignments. There are teachers in a classroom who aren't asked whether they'd like to have additional kids in their classroom. They are put in there. And so all of this and shifting around and having people bopping in and out, these are little bodies sitting in these classrooms year after year, not getting the instruction they need. When is it going to be enough? I mean, we sit here and talk about this all the time. It's, it is, it's, it's ridiculous. Why do they not deserve the best? Why do they not deserve to have certified teachers in their classroom? And we've got them floating all around doing all this extraneous stuff, and I'm sorry. I saw the Cotton Club thing, and I thought, yeah, there are teachers in classrooms that would have loved to have had a, a morning out at Cotton Club. These, the, the, and, and I... TSAs are great if we have teachers in our classrooms, but we don't have certified teachers. We have bodies in there. And who's going to speak up for these kids? We can't continue to talk. Here we are in March, where it's March, and they're still sitting there with long-term subs in classrooms, and we have certified teachers who are, are really good because that's why they're in that TSA position. Now, I'd, I'd rather have a, a teacher who is kind of holding her own and working towards her certification in a classroom and, and, and have the Title I person go in and provide support and, and have one of those TSAs in a, in a real classroom with these 22 bodies sitting there. I, I, I just don't understand this, and I, it, it bothers me tremendously because this is not something new, and we've been talking about it. And, and you know, I, I say, let's get the TSAs in there. Well, we'll ask them and see if, if, if any want to go in there. That's not acceptable. And as a leader, you have to make hard decisions. And you have to say, I'm sorry, but, you know, you can choose to do that if you want to. You can assign somebody to go in there and say, move your, your people who you think would be best in this classroom. But asking for volunteers and then halfway throwing people in there at random times is not acceptable. Um, whose hand? Yours? Her hand, but I'm, I want um, to you. Okay, so Ms. Ward, I'm going to let you come to the mic, but Dr. McNeely, go ahead. Thank you, um, Ms. Abbott, with your comments. My comments would be <laughs> all of the training that you're restructuring with your TSAs and administrators. I'm even wondering what's going to happen. The superintendent shared with me and possibly other colleagues on the, sitting on this side about the work that we're going to be doing for summer. If you're planning now for the rest of the year, I'm just wondering how are we going to infuse all of this curriculum and information because come the final test and one of the schools that I'm working with, the majority of the children are in the red area. And it bothered me that these kids may not move out of that area. So what's going to be the difference 
when you place them in school this summer? Are you going to have different teachers? Are you going to, I don't know. I don't know your plan. I don't, the superintendent said this is what his direction would be. But I've not heard anything else about what does that look like? What is it going to be? Are, are, and it's not supposedly just 20 days as we, or 12 days. So I'm just wondering, what are the plans? We hear great things, Mrs. Wise, and you all have been doing a, a great job, but the action that you've put forth is not in the results that we need to see, and you have to agree with that. You have agreed with that. I have. I'm not sure. I want to make sure I understand your question. Was what the what question the is about ESY. the children who are all in this red, right. and they're not all third graders. Right. So what's going to be the plan for those kids and those parents? And what are we? What what what's our opportunity for these children? Because they'll be back with us come August. Right. And 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 <laughs> I'm just wondering. That's what the superintendent said to me that was his goal. I don't know if that's what t the staff and the team might be working on. You so we are working on our, our summer programming and that will come to you um, in both extended by time but also extended by content. So I think you're aware our you said, you know, is it twelve or twenty and ESY has traditionally been primarily for our third graders who didn't meet promotion criteria and then maybe some small other identified uh, students supported by our Title I ESY and for our secondary students just those who are retrieving their credits. That's so, not what I got from the super. That's what we've been doing in the past. So moving forward, right. moving forward, we want to include more students than just students who don't meet pr uh, promotion uh, criteria in third grade. We want to bring more students to school for um, intervention and support, but we also want to bring them for some activities that are more engaging and hands-on. Uh, Dr. Boker has brought forward through some of those ESSER smaller grants, some specifically they have to happen outside of the normal school day with our collaborations with some of our partners because a limitation for us, frankly, in the summer is finding high impact teachers who want to continue working through June and into July. Um, a lot of our teachers are using that time to refresh and get ready to come back in August and, and do the good work. Um, so we're looking, trying to be creative and think if we could get um, some of our families don't want to participate or find it challenging to participate in ESY because it ends at 11.30 or 12. And then what can they do with their especially elementary age students for the rest of the day? So we're trying to think how can we provide a full day of programming um, that's academic but also enriching and maybe supporting our students around some of the um, emotional social learning that helps deal with the challenges we're having with behavior and with their peer relations. Um, but all of that is a challenge due to um, our personnel limitations. And it, I hear what you're saying. It needs to be impactful. Uh, we do use different programming in the summer. We'll be using UFLY, and we've had SAIL uh, literacy programming in the past. And I think Mr. Berry is here if you want to know more specifically around what we do in ELA for elementary school. But I've asked the team to work on what can we do to support math. The math scores are very troubling. And I don't think we can continue to only address ELA in the summer for our elementary students. So we're working on a plan to do that as well. I'm glad to hear you say that. And um, Ms. Andrew one. had shared it would not be two or three hours. It would be all day. And I just, you know, it's nice to know that these are things that you want to do. I'd like to see the plan. And so if you say that the plan is going to be ready for May, um, the parents need to know what's going on. I, 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 I don't know how you're going to get 
all of this information done, that you're stating that you will have it. Um, I applaud you at this point, but I certainly want to see it. I've heard so many different things about plans. Mrs. Dr. Edwards, I don't see her here today, but she mentioned last night plans. Plans are nice. But you know where I'm going with this. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Wise. Ms. Ward. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Um, thank you, Board Certain. Um, I would like to respond a bit in defense of the instructional coaches and TSAs. I did have a TSA contact my office that was asked to volunteer, and she really um, illustrated how many schools she supported. Nine schools were supported by one instructional coach. And about, I think it was about 30 classrooms. So we have people in those positions that are sharing their expertise. And these are not normal times. During normal times, we definitely, everyone in the room wants a certified teacher in front of every classroom. But that is not where we, at, we are. And so having this filter, because I keep seeing this basket and we're putting all these new teachers in, but we have a hole in our basket and they are falling right out. We, are, we have a revolving door of people leaving the district. And those instructional coaches are like a filter. They are supporting, there are people that say they would leave if they didn't have that support. It is, it is crucial, and I, I just don't want it to um, be minimized or think that they're superfluous, because they, they really play a crucial, they, they do help long-term subs as well, as the superintendent said. Um, the long-term subs don't have mentor teachers. We don't have a program to support mentor teachers that I know of. I don't think we fund any mentor teachers. Um, and that's, that's problematic because that would be an additional support in those schools for, for the long-term subs because we have, we have many. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Ms. Ward. I have um, experienced the... Not I'm not a teacher, so I haven't experienced it, but I, in my being in the SI schools for a long period of time, I have complained, Ms. Jones will tell you this, of the number of alternative certifications and novice teachers in our most challenging environments. I feel they've, they've borne too much of that burden. And I know the coaches are needed in those environments because those, some of those teachers that are in those classrooms, they've passed the certification exam, but they don't have the education background. Okay, so that would be like someone like me who's an accountant going in to teach third grade. I would be lost, and I know I would need someone. And I've made the suggestion that the concentration of the coaches, they spend more time at the schools. They cover less time because you have a school like Idlewild that has so many, and I just say, say Idlewild and Lake Forest because they have so many new teachers and they have so much turnover. So I'm not minimizing the role there. I just think they need, the, the coaches need to be really, really sharp and know how to support the teachers. The principal needs to know how to do that. I mean, everybody needs to do that because if you got this new person that's in that. So that's not my complaint. My, my complaint is that we have the vacancies, and that's the reason why I request this information here, so we can see it can be front line. My, my, my frustration with this is I don't think putting a TSA in the classroom at this point in time for the rest of the year is going, it, it's demoralizing to that staff person, one. And I think it makes, we're putting on them the burden, because that's what's been told to me, to make up what didn't happen from August until March. And they're being expected to be a miracle worker. One person said to me, one of them certain, I am a teacher, 
and I'm a new coach, but I'm not a miracle worker. And I don't know these students, and I don't know their parents. And I can go in and I can teach, and I'm going to do my best if they put me there. But I, I, I shouldn't be expected to make up a whole year of learning when I've only been in that room for nine weeks. And I, that is what I don't want. And we would look here and say, oh, well, they had a certified teacher in the class and they didn't do well. And I don't want her to feel like that is her, that's an albatross around her neck because those students didn't progress alone. That's not, that, that wasn't, that's not her, her, her issue. So I do see that point. I would have rather the decision had been made to move someone. You're right, the leader does, can, can make a decision. I made several um, suggestions as to how we can do that, but that's just to fix, if we move them in right now, and this, what, this plan we're doing right now is just a fix for this year. We have to look at how are we going to handle this or face this challenge or deal with, solve the challenge in the next school year because the next school year we're going to have this list all over again because that reassignment is only going to be for right now for this current school year if I understand the CBA correctly. It's only it's a temporary reassignment. It's not like we're putting them there and that's what's going to happen. So I think we have to figure out a way of how we're going to staff um, our classroom so we can deliver high quality instruction to every single student in every single classroom, which we know is not happening right now. And I think that's the frustration of, our, of the board members and, 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 and probably our superintendent and the deputy as well. Uh, well, I, um, in response, Ms. Ward, and, and I've gotten emails and, uh, that, that weren't very pleasant about from TSAs and, 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 um, and TSAs have great value. When you have a district that's thriving and surviving, TSAs are a bonus, but, but we don't. And do, you, you can look back at all these other schools at the top of the list, Childs, Wiles, Meadowbrook, how many long-term subs are in those schools? None. Because parents would just go ballistic. But we got this group of kids down here whose parents, for, for, for whatever reason, they're not, they're not the squeaky wheels. And so somebody's got to advocate for these kids down here. And, and no one expects a TSA to go in and be a miracle worker for nine weeks and for those kids to, to score above the 41st percentile. But don't they deserve nine, nine weeks of quality instruction? I mean, are we, just, are we just crossing them off for the year saying, oh, well, well, we'll look at it next year. We'll solve it next year. We've been saying this for years. Look at these schools here. I mean, at some point... We have got to give these kids a break. And, and I am, you know, and, 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 you know, people are hired to work for the district. If you're a teacher, you're a teacher. It doesn't matter if you teach PE, if you teach reading, if you teach high school, elementary school, if you're a TSA, you're a teacher. And you're, you should, you're here to educate children, and that should be our top priority. And, and, and I, I just don't know what we're doing. And, and I am, I we cannot continue to say we're going to do this and we'll put it off for another time. I don't care if it is nine weeks. Those kids deserve nine weeks of instruction. It may pull them up a couple of percentage points, but they deserve that. And I, I don't know. I, I'm speechless. So, students so, deserve. I'm, go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to respectfully disagree. When we're looking at the future of our district, and we see these empty positions. And I've asked for this data repeatedly, so I'm going to ask for it again. I want to know how many teachers in our classrooms are long-term subs or alternately certified so they never got education training. I want to know that. But, and then I want to know how many of those long-term subs and alternately certified teachers are being supported by each of our TSAs because if we have, you know, these openings now, but we don't support these people who are in our classrooms, right. we're gonna double or triple these openings. And so we've given 20 students a teacher and lost teachers for another 60 students. That is not sustainable. We need our TSAs, but they need to be impactful. And I see us collecting this ABC data. We are collecting so much data and we are reporting on it every month for our students. I want similar data on our TSAs and our administrators. I want to know how many classrooms that TSA visited. I want to know 
maybe some feedback from the teacher. What kind of support did they get? Was it helpful? You know, we need to know that the, the interventions that we're providing are impactful. I want to know from all of our administrators, are they accessing these reports, this ABC scorecard for their school? There's a school level scorecard. Are they accessing that every month and are they adjusting how they're going to reach our goals around ABC data and their SIP goals? Are they adjusting to that? Are they using this data? I want, you know, I mean, I can request it. It's not really for me. It's for Mr. Andrew and his team to review. Like, are the people we have in our leadership roles, whether they're instructional coaches or administrators, using this data and adjusting what they're doing? I also think that we need to be really intentional and really creative about how we use TSAs and their expertise. We want them to be able to be as impactful as possible, and I've suggested this. If we can get our technology team to follow a TSA for a day and record, you know, TSAs come in, they teach model lessons. Let's record them. Let's put them up on Canvas so any teacher who wants to watch that model lesson can watch it. And maybe at the end, Afterward, the TSA can explain some of the different things that they did in that model lesson to make it really effective to help more teachers. You know, we need to be as impactful as possible. I don't think that the solution is pulling our support system and losing teachers as a result, but we need to make sure that that support system is actually providing support. And I know that this meeting you just had is a start on that, but we need more. Let me let me ask this, um, Ms. Wright. With the long term subs, are we? Uh, how do we support them? Like my daughter made a, a statement to me. She said, "I'm a long term sub. You all have these orientations and PD uh, professional development for your beginning teachers. Why are we not invited to that? That's to me. That's another way. And that's a good point. Uh, that's another way to support. Um, how are we doing that? Because if they're if you got your new teachers. And these people are going to be there long term. It's just like they're a new teacher, but they they feel they're not being supported. And that when Ms. Rockwell made that comment, I thought about what the conversation that we had about long term subs. And another thing is, we 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 got to catch up. And so the ESSA funds you asked you all to talk about being creative. I thought we had some money remaining for ESSA funds because that was the purpose of that money to catch us up during the summer. Um, partnering with other people can we provide transportation if that program is at 1130. I'm just trying to come up with other solutions that can help us so that we can get these. And also, when something is really working and it's great, and I, I'm going to throw it out there, Karen and Sherry are moving kids. They're moving them. So what is wrong with consulting with people who know how to move kids and get, and get them to where they need to be. And I think that's a great idea. We've been, you know, everybody up here, and I don't want to get into saying the same thing, but as somebody who's been involved for a long time, we, we, we're over we're a decade with our children not moving. And so we got to get them moving. And so let's see how we can look at, I'm at solution point. We can talk all day. We can look at this. I, I, you know, it, it's not what it is. But contract out, because our bottom line is to move these children and make sure they improve academically. So those are some of the things I want to say. Go, 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 con you know, because they work hard. So specifically with caring and sharing, Dr. Boker has reached out and we're um, looking to share and have some of our students mm -hmm. participate in their IM STEM, STEM program, uh, mm -hmm. summer program, as well mm -hmm. as continuing to learn what's working well for them. So. We are uh, working on strengthening that partnership so and, that we can learn best practices. And, and to your comments, Dr. Rockwell, um, Mr. Gilfillan and I have talked a lot about being able to quantify and show the board how many teachers, specifically alt certified and long-term subs, our mentor coaches, our professional development specialists, our curriculum specialists are supporting, and we can bring that to you and then multiply that out by how many students that's um, touching, as well as um, continuing to align their work so that we know what they're doing and the administrators know what they're doing and are continuing to 
offer follow-up and feedback to the teachers around those same things when the TSAs are not there because that's another important piece of it and a lot of you have spoken about what are we doing to also touch base with the administrators so they understand the scope of work and what we're working on and doing fewer things ruthlessly well is something that we've talked a lot about and when we identify those high um, impact strategies and curriculum materials and intervention materials we want to make sure everyone understands well how that what that looks like in practice and how to give feedback around it when that's not what we're seeing and so that's how we're using the teacher specialists I think a good piece of data to have would be um, to follow these kids at the SI schools and see how successful they are in middle school and high school I'm sure that it would be a reflection of their elementary school education. <clears throat> Dr. Tessman. Um, I just want to make sure that we're careful about collecting numbers um, and just collecting long-term sub numbers because some students aren't lucky enough to have a long-term sub. They have sub after sub after sub after sub or they are taught by an intern and I know at Wiles they're using their interns a lot as subs and while there, our interns are a huge value to us, that is a lot to put on an intern. And that is something we do district wide. That is not, but when, when I heard, you know, that maybe Wiles doesn't have long term subs, but they may have found other solutions that, that may not be reported if we don't ask for the right numbers. Um, and we have ESPs being subs day after day after day in different classrooms. And they're not provided with the training that substitutes are provided with either. Um, so those are just more important numbers. Um, and it's, um, I, I'm concerned too. I, I do agree it's too late this year to place TSAs who are not volunteering in a classroom. It's already hard to take over a classroom a week late, a month late, two months late. This is past the first semester. Um, I think the best way to utilize them would be if we want to do something next year, do what you know Dr. Rockwell was mentioning and also use them as a departmentalized teacher. If they go in and they teach their area of expertise and we schedule it right, they can hit several classrooms in a school every day and be their math teacher, be their reading teacher. They can be in there with a long-term sub if need be, and they both can pull groups. The only way to be a high-impact teacher for math is to have small group instruction. There's just no way to do it if you, if you can't um, for struggling learners. So, um, and I just, again, with placing TSAs who don't volunteer, it, it's important to have a qualified person in the room, but you need to have a person who wants to be there. Or they're going to leave, or the kids are going to feel that. Thank you. Do we, ha before we move on, do we have any other citizen input? Do we have any phone calls? Any other citizen input on this? Any other board questions or... Ms. Wise, I think um, not to, we, we've beat it a, beat a, beat, not to beat the dead horse, but we did have a lot and we threw a lot at you and your team and I think we threw a lot at you that is not all up under your purview <laughs> when you just said that you don't have PD up under you. So um, I didn't realize that. I, I need to study the org chart better. I mean, ultimately I'm comfortable. Um, thank you for that, first of all, I should say, but also um, I, care and feel a great deal of responsibility for every student and to the extent that they master grade level benchmarks. So um, it is with relentless energy and determination that we will continue to do better. Thank you for that. I've heard that a lot. So we, but we got to. We got to turn, as they say, turn the curve. I'm, I got to turn the curve meeting with United Way tomorrow. <laughs> we got to turn the curve and start like going towards the finish line because it is extremely frustrating. We, we have, I think, um, while we're here and we're talking about the SI schools and I think our leadership hears the frustration and they hear us kind of going around this, this mountain here. But I think the challenge is and how are we going to to staff 
our SI schools with, with good instructors? That, that is really the question. And, and the deficits in hire, hiring, the vacancies should not be borne by the schools in the East as they have been. I'm, I'm gonna repeat that. I keep saying that. I've said it in my SI and, meeting. And, and, and this one thing, Madam Chair, it, it's not just the teachers. It's leadership. Yes. That principal. If it, 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 and it's not, it's not personal, but if the principal in these SI schools, you have to be assertive. You have to be aggressive. Here's what we're doing. Now, I can see that at one school. So if that's good, that's, you don't have to create critique. And let's get it moving. But it has to be strong leadership. And if it's not, we got to look at, like I talk about the right fit. Skill, will, and I'm going to keep it real. Is it the skill set? Am I willing to change? I'm not willing to change. We, we have to. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll just close with, I think, just because I heard, I'm a, I'm a data person, so I heard lots of this talk of, of numbers and metrics and things we want to track. I, I, I think I heard three just general, what I would call clumps of data, which is around people data, student data, and general operations data. I think I already hear a lot of really important discussions about what are the things we need to track and be really good at? What are the things that are gonna drive our work? And I think just my offering is, I think as we go into the strategic planning process, I think that's gonna be a lot of the work we get to do. So I, we have received and, and, and heard those, and I would say continue thinking about those things that when we get and are starting to get into our strategic planning process, what are the things that we're gonna look at constantly to know if what we're doing is working and if we're going where we wanna go. So everything I heard, I think, is, is well aligned to that process. I know we're getting ready to start. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. I'm gonna go back to the parent because they are the ones who will call and write us, come right before school closes, and they will say, I didn't know. All right, I need to see what has been done with all of these children who are not performing where they should be. I don't want to get 50 calls like I did last year about we didn't know. I think I understand that you have a homeschool liaison almost in every school. And if that is the case, I hope that the leadership will instruct them to get the parents to the school or the team will go sit on their porch and share the information. But please don't have a parent calling us saying they didn't know what was going on, that their child was not performing, that now they face possibly math, summer programming, or reading ELA, Please, I'm getting calls, I'm being stopped in the public all of the time. We don't know what's going on in our schools. And I know there are two sides to a story because I'm sure that the administration at each school, they have tried so much to get the contact. Use your Teach, not the teachers on special assignment, your home school liaison. If that's what they, <laughs> I don't know if they know their duties and what they're responsible for. But we've got to figure out how to stop working in our different silos, pulling everyone together and let me say this, as a former principal at a school that showed Fs and Ds, but we came out because we were a team, we cared about each other, 
We celebrated all kind of things. That's why I'm broke today, because <laughs> I paid for stuff for my staff. You have to celebrate your teachers and make them feel welcome. Maybe we won't have as many severances at the end come June. I don't know. But what I do know, everything that the team has tried, every single thing, we can all, those of us who are elected, we can all give you all kind of recommendations. But we are not there. And so the people who are there, the principals, the staff, the custodians, the lunchroom folk, I shouldn't say lunchroom, but food and nutrition. Um, all of the people should understand what their goal is at that school. If there's one person who doesn't get it, who doesn't feel it, then we've got a problem. Everyone, database, person who answers the phone, everyone should feel this, we've got to come together. You've got to have that feeling. And if you don't, especially our parents who don't feel welcome a lot of times, <laughs> there's some people who don't understand and may not look like us who are sitting up here, but who love their children and need to know what's going on. Can I not emphasize that enough? Mr. Taylor, I'm saying Mr. Taylor because you know I have problems with your last name. I, I, I'm going to say to you and your team, do more than what you have done. This is great. I can read it. I just need to go home now and get the pages straight, so I, and, and I will be coming to your office, please know that, for help. But I'm worrying, I worry, I worry <laughs> every night. I don't wanna get emotional, but I know that there are some problems that we have not solved. And I've said this to my good friend over here, and he's pulling his hair out as I'm talking to him because he's the one that has to push it out, and Mrs. Jones, and Ms. Wise, Mr. Berry, and Ms. Leinenbach, and Ms. Roll, and Ms. Dell, and Ms. Wakely. I want to have a big celebration with all of you because we need to come together and, and, and share all of the great things. The music in our schools, Mom, great. But then when we come to these reports, my, 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 please help us. Please work with the individual parents. I'm saying it to the homeschool liaisons. Don't be sitting in offices looking at your computer get to these homes every single day, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. McNeely. Um, thank you all. Um, we're gonna take a five minute break and we'll receive um, our second item, uh, restorative justice from the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building. Give us about five minutes. We'll come back at um, 1124, 11.25. Yes, ma'am.
Hey, my girlfriend, every time she comes to Gainesville, I'm always in a meeting, it seems like. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I guess they're thinking this didn't work, didn't apply to them. Everyone, I'm going to call us back to order, um, if I could. Uh, and... Um, I want to welcome um, and thank the River, Center, River Phoenix Center for Peace Building for coming, and we're going to give them a time now. Um, they've been invited by, um, or Dr. McNeely asked that they come to give us a workshop to present. They have, have been working with the district for a number of years before I took my seat and all, um, and they're going to come and have a discussion with us today. And discussions and workshop and ideas that are presented in a workshop, just level set, you know, it's information sharing. We don't vote and set policy or anything like that. And just because we hear something in a workshop doesn't mean that we go forward with it. It is just, it's informational only just for us to receive and to discuss. Okay. So, Dr. McNeil, I'm not sure if you want to say something before they get going or you just want to let them go. I'm excited that you're here, your team. Um, I want my colleagues to understand what I've learned in my short existence with you and the um, wonderful opportunities for students. We need you to share the information that you shared with me and more. Um, and we'll all have questions and um, a citizen told me the other day to purchase a book, and I did, and I hope that will tie into everything that you'll be sharing today. Okay? Thank you so much. Um, Chair Certain and the board, it's nice to meet you all. I, I haven't met you yet. Again, my name's Jeffrey Weisberg. I'm a co-founder and executive director of the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building. We've been in operation for about 10 years, working in a, a broad spectrum of, of different um, programs and services and strategies, working with the school district and law enforcement and uh, mental health, et cetera, but really with the aim of providing skills and different perspectives of how do we not only resolve conflict, but improve and enhance relationships. And, and at the core of what we're going to be talking about today with you is, is relationships. And I just wanted to read a, a very brief excerpt from, I believe, the book that you're referencing, Dr. McNeely. It, it's called What Happened to You? Um, and it's from um, Dr. Bruce, Bruce Perry, who's a, a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. And uh, if you're not familiar with that book, I just highly, highly recommend it. But he says, um, now, as I've suggested before, what is adaptive for children living in chaotic, violent, trauma-permeated environments becomes maladaptive in other environments, especially school. The hypervigilance of the alert state is mistaken for ADHD. The resistance and defiance of alarm and fear get labeled as oppositional defiant disorder. Flight behavior gets them suspended from school. Fight behavior gets them charged with assault. The pervasive misunderstanding of trauma-related behavior has a profound effect on our educational, mental health, and juvenile justice systems. The more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he or she will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change, and the most powerful therapy is human love. I thought that was very uh, appropriate because the, the previous discussion, I think the, the underpinning of it, as, as I understand it, or at least a major part of it, is, is that everybody is dealing with a whole host of different stressors and challenges. And there's not one strategy, there's not one... Uh, you know, policy, there's not one um, person that is able to solve that. And so as we're talking about restorative justice and restorative practices, 
as a, a methodology and a theory of change, we, we have to understand that we, if we only see what's above the waterline and an iceberg, we're missing the vast majority of who our children and who our adults really are. So um, it's, it's with that idea and that metaphor that we really want to kind of introduce to you a few of the concepts of restorative practices and um, how it can be a tool in your toolkit to help support addressing behavior and to building relationships, to holding young people accountable, and to finding uh, you know, greater alliance in terms of mutual goals and, and people's uh, interests in that respect. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as we have identified within ourselves coming to you today, um, these are the two kind of key areas that I think we'd most like to address. So how can we more effectively prevent and, and address challenging and disruptive behavior? It is quite endemic in so many different classrooms. Uh, and, and then further, how do we support, um, foster supportive and responsive school communities? How do we grow that sense of community for not only staff and, and teachers and students, but also families. How are we really incorporating those? And so what we might suggest is that restorative practices is a way of building bridges uh, to address some of those elements, those needs, some of those behaviors, and to bring those constructive resources to bear uh, to more effectively address or, or, or uh, uh, attend to those things. There it is. I see. So, um, so the first thing we want to do is just kind of define restorative. Oh, wow! I came in with an entrance, didn't I? Look at that. Is that better? Okay. Well, my name is Eric Essling. Thank you, Art. Uh, I'm the managing director of the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building. I'm really, really honored to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, a good place to start um, this discussion is just with the definition of what restorative practices are or is. The field of restorative practices is really about understanding relationship, the power of relationship, how to build it, how to maintain it, and then when it is harmed, when relationships are harmed, how to repair it effectively. That's where the restorative comes in. How do we restore harms that have occurred? How do we restore relationships, but also how do we restore people? And so restorative practices is a, uh, is a continuum of practices that aims at building and understanding um, uh, relationships that can help support people's needs, as Jeffrey was saying. So really, the way we break that down is into three pillars. So the first is community building. I just want to reference something that Dr. McNeely said in the last section about um, the school that you worked at. And you said, we pulled through because we cared for each other. And, and, and that really is kind of, in some ways, the heart of this work. As Jeffrey was suggesting, resiliency um, really depends on connection. When people feel connected to each other, when they feel like they can understand each other, and most importantly, when they feel understood by each other, there's that common sense of community, that sense of shared space, of shared identity. So really, in, in terms of community building, what we're talking about is moving from a place of isolation, a place of disconnection, to a place of connection. And that's really the foundational piece of this work. The next is equity development. So what we're talking about here is moving from um, power over relationships, you know, looking at whose voices are heard, whose voices are respected, whose voices are marginalized or even ignored. How can we build inclusive spaces where people can understand each other, be understood, and share in the development of that community that I was referring to earlier? And then lastly, conflict resolution. So we believe that if we do a really good job building community and we do a really good job sharing power, we're, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna re uh, prevent a lot of conflicts from occurring. But conflicts will still occur, breaks in relationship will still happen, disruptive and challenging behaviors will still take place. And so the question then becomes, when those things occur, how can we rebuild trust? What does that mean, sorry? Oh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I thought you were giving me a signal there. I, I apologize. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's all in the bridge. 
Oh, this is the signal. Yes, we discussed. Yeah, we discussed the cutoff signal. I was like, oh, maybe this is the cutoff signal. Um, perfect. So, when those when those uh, those conflicts do occur, how can we rebuild trust, rebuild people, and restore those relationships in such a way that affirms that community and that shares power? So, really, the continuum of these kinds of services are offered, um, you know, on a spectrum. From on one side, we have like the least formal and the most universal to the most formal and kind of the most specific. So the vast majority of this work is preventative. It's about building community. It's about finding new ways of engaging and including people in processes. It's about sharing and visioning together. It's about celebrating each other. That's a huge part about this work. It's about building skills and understanding so that when conflict or harm occurs, people have the skill sets necessary to respond in the best possible way. But the tier two is also about when, when we notice that there maybe is a specific dynamic present or if there is um, you know, a, a, an incident that maybe isn't the most serious but is still causing a harm on some level, how can we use dialogue or use conversations that we can have in circles or just in, in side conversations to, um, to build understanding, to, to share uh, our um, experience and, and build some trust together? And then lastly, tier three would be you know, the most kind of serious um, situations. They would call for what's called, for, uh, called a restorative justice conference. So a restorative justice conference would be a conversation between somebody who has caused a harm and then somebody who has been impacted by that harm and then other community members who have been impacted as well to talk about what happened, what was the impact, how can we repair that harm, and then how can we prevent it from happening again. And so those are the most formal um, kinds of uh, uh, processes that happen within a restorative practices approach. Um, yeah. So, so in those approaches, um, oh, is this yours? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. So Corey Collins, Youth and Community Specialist for Phoenix Center for Peace Building. Good morning, everyone. Um, and so I've been in education for over 20 years, and I have seen a shift from what we used to do to what we're doing now. And I see the need for having more trauma-informed approaches and responses to our students. Quit saying we are dealing with behavior. We are working with students and their behavior because we all know under that behavior, under that iceberg, is a need that's not being met. And so we can look at the, the traditional approach on what was happening. I remember being in those classrooms. I remember being that teacher. I had that big stick. I love to use it. That did not create a community in my classroom with which students wanted to come and learn. When I stepped away from trying to make sure I was the only person handling behavior, when I was the only one doling it out, when I was the only one isolating and putting you out of the room, and it came into a conversation for our class, how we want to go forward with this individual to make sure they can stay in here and learn, because that is what the board wants these schools to do, keep kids in the classroom so they can learn. We're only going to be able to do that if we're building that community in which someone can make a harm and then come back in and prevent it and repair it. And so we're trying to move to where we are talking about facilitating that accountability. It is more than just getting a referral. Let's talk about why the referral was written. Let's talk about how it impacted the entire class. Let's talk about how the individual can repair it. And let's talk about how a class we can prevent it. We are pulling in all involved parties and supporters. That kid, their family, their friends, school administration, all of these ripple effects of the impact and how it impacts the classroom and the school, we're bringing all of those parties into the uh, circle to talk about this. We are talking about and letting that accountability for the student and the person harmed to actually talk about that. Many times now in our schools, we give a referral, the kid goes to the dean's office, they go home. The person who was impacted never gets talked to or rarely gets talked to. The kid comes back to school, the same behavior happens again, we send them home again. And we're doing this over and over again. When we do a restorative approach, we're bringing both of these individuals in a, in a conversation to talk about what went wrong, what was the breakdown in that community, and then how can we both go together with potentially a support from a teacher or administration to make sure this does not happen. And we're talking about establishing connections and relationships. We want young people to leave these schools and go off and practice some of these things they're learning. I need to remind you, we're also talking about this for teachers. You mentioned about teachers leaving. There is not a sense of community. There are needs that are not being met. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying a principal can meet all of those, but we need to have a place where teachers feel heard, students feel heard, and they can come together to be heard together to, to reach a common goal. 
And so that's part of the restorative approach we want to be talking about and bringing to schools. I was excited uh, the other day. I was reading through some of your um, district guidelines for behavior, and I saw a lot of instances where you all talk about restorative justice conferences. You talk about using a restorative toolkit. You talk about restorative circles. We want to make sure we can support the people doing that, and we don't want to leave it just for the deans to do. You saw that uh, diagram. A lot of this can be happening on tier one. Classroom conversations. Uh, celebrating these small successes. Not waiting for the Abiana rule. Recognizing when a kid comes for five days and brought a backpack and a pencil, let's celebrate that too. And so finding ways to celebrate our most challenging student to our most successful student. We can do that through community because we all want to see each other win. And so, you know, we're thinking about that. We are in a, the county schools right now. Jeffrey has worked with the county for a while, has been a part of writing some of this verbiage in that discipline guide. You know, we're already at Newberry, we're already at Howard Bishop, Rawlings, and Resilience. I'm doing some direct um, training, uh, direct information or direct work with students. I'm also coming to support and mentor teachers who are doing some of these circles. And as an organization, we're coming around and really wrapping around these schools who have reached out to us and say they want to see these principals on their campus. How can we best support them? How can we talk to their teachers to make sure they're doing these circles with fidelity? How can we come back in and circle around with some of your more challenging students? Uh, I'm doing a small group at Newberry with nine ninth graders who are having a lot of issues right now skipping school, classroom distractions. And so right now I'm doing this a leadership and mentoring with these young men. What is your goal? What do you want to do when you leave school? How can we be more in touch with our school community? Who are the teachers you feel support you? How can we talk to them more so you can get back in the class? I'm doing a similar group at Howard Bishop where I have nine eighth graders that account for 60% of the referrals. Now, I would tell you they're petty referrals, and that's just my verbiage walking out, being disrespectful, classroom distractions. They're not fighting, but they're also not turning in their homework. They're also not making A's and B's. They're also feeling not a part of that classroom. And I'm telling them, we can't blame the teacher for you not feeling a part. What have you done to express what it is you need? Well, with restorative practices, we are trying to get children and teachers to tap into what is it that you need. Let's get beneath that surface or the iceberg so we can find out what it is you need and then how can I help you get that need. Teachers want support from administration. I want to talk to administration. We did a circle over the summer, uh, I guess last semester, with a teacher at Howard Bishop where thankfully some of you on this board came to this circle to educate this teacher and she walked away saying, oh, now I understand why this kid was not immediately removed. She was educated. But because of that circle, a safe place where she was able to express her need and then have administration from the county come in and say, hey, here's what it really is. And we talked about it in a safe environment. Now we both walked away with some understanding. This teacher is now one of our biggest proponents for restorative practices on her campus. She is doing classroom groups. She's reaching out to other students in other classrooms. She wants to build more community. And that happened through just a little circle where we were able to talk about and understand each other's opinions and then talk about ways to prevent that. We want to see that at our schools. We are all aware that you all have, are doing a lot of things. I know the schools are doing many great things. I'm at a lot of these amazing schools. I also know they have a huge challenge with some of that behavior. Mm -hmm. And so when we can start looking at it as a trauma-informed and trying to figure out what is under that behavior, then we can start changing some of those behaviors. And then we're looking at really changing our communities at large, our families at large. When I can go home and tell my mom how I really feel, then we can help each other out versus mm -hmm. I'm fine, I'm good, everything's straight. Mm -hmm. And so we're really wanting to give teachers, parents, students, families, that ability to express your feelings. Your feelings are important. We need to know what they are so we can help address that need. The gun violence we see in our community is from a breakdown in addressing and getting people the needs they actually have. I'm not saying it's any one of our individual responsibility, but we are training young people to go out and be actual adults. And she should be training them, hey, how can we resolve conflicts peacefully? How can I get you to the need you actually need? How can we give some of those other resources? And so that's what we're talking about doing. And you know, the beautiful thing is all of the schools up here on this list reach out to us. 
We're not going around beating on doors. These are administration and teachers saying, hey, I've seen some of what you do. We want this at our school. We were just contacted by Sidley Lanier and Pace about wanting to have their staff trained. And so that speaks huge to me in terms of adults recognizing we have a part to play in these children's lives. We don't have to just be punitive. Restorative practice, as Eric said, is not erasing the consequence, mm -hmm. but it is bringing them back into community when they come back. And that's what's most important, because we see this problem at our adult level with people coming back out of prison. There is no real way for them to get reacquainted into real life, and we're doing that at our schools right now. And so we want restorative practices to be used, and our ask is across the county with schools who are interested so that their staff can feel more a part of their community, so students can feel a part of that community, so needs are being addressed. And so here's some of the myths we've heard about restorative practices. You may be thinking some of these same things. Matter of fact, look up there. Which one stood out to you? Dr. Rockwell, which one stood out to you? Talk about it. And um, when, whenever you do an approach that is more based on collaboration and communication than punishment, people say, well, where's the consequence? Where's the punishment? Yeah. And some situations require punishment, but you still do the restoration afterward. But just because your consequence is problem solving together and solutions based rather than punishment based doesn't mean there's not a consequence. And I think as a society, we're very focused on punishment. And that's not an appropriate focus. Indeed. I didn't pay her for that response, by the way. <laughs> Absolutely correct. And so we hear that a lot. Where's the consequence? Well, many times the loss of community is a much larger consequence than you going home. Many of our students have realized I can get away from work if I'm disrespectful, if I walk out of the classroom, or if I fight. Then I can go home and I can chill. Nothing's required of me there. And we're saying we need students in school so they can learn. That is a larger consequence. I'm not letting you off the hook from not learning. You still need to be learning. Yes, sir. Well, I was just going to add as well that um, one of the differences that we like to emphasize is this piece that punishment doesn't always equate accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability is very, very key. And we, we feel like when, when a harm or a difficult behavior occurs, we have to hold people accountable for the impact of that. But for us, what that really means is understanding the impact yes. that's been caused and then taking meaningful steps to make it better and to prevent it from happening again. So for us, you know, when we send someone home, uh, you know, and, and again, like Corey was saying, it, it may be necessary, you know, that's, that's not to say that it's always unnecessary or something, but, but then how, when they're coming back, how can we facilitate a conversation with them so that they understand what's happened, you know, who's been impacted, and what they can do now to make it right. Sometimes that missing piece is just never fulfilled, and that doesn't allow for an opportunity for people to take real accountability. In that way, we think that in some sense, um, you know, accountability can be even more uh, uh, required or invited in a restorative process than a punitive one. That's good. Sure, please. Who are you? Oh, so glad. <laughs> nice to meet me. I mean, nice to meet. Uh, I'm Hart Phoenix. I'm also co-founder, and I'm the board president at the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building. Um, what were we talking about? Accountability. Oh, thank you so much. No yeah. So you, uh, that's it. That's all I have to say <laughs> because uh, I had to introduce myself, and that's hard enough. So I'll come back to it, but. I think that I think really when we say accountability, the, the the part of this that's so important is that it's not an imposed something that's imposed. Because you did this, this is what's going to happen to you. Do you understand that? It's something that when the circle or the group gets together, everyone dis, has a suggestion or what they think, and everyone has to agree to it. So that is very different when you have a part. In, in deciding what what it is I'm willing to do to to be uh, able to re-enter the classroom, everything, you do it. It's your own heart. The other part of it is also when you are in a circle or when you are facing someone that you've harmed or you are the person that did the harm, mm -hmm. 
you have this relationship, you're hearing a story that you didn't know. You didn't know the backstory of when you hit that kid that day, what happened to that kid that morning. Nobody knows what's really behind it. And when you start to uncover, you start to discover, you start to recover your whole mental attitude towards it. Empathy arises, compassion comes, humanity emerges, and that breaks through all of the lines that so often we just say, when somebody does something bad, get out of the classroom, or whatever, it's the classroom or the family, or you know, get out of the house right now, whatever it is. So I think that those are, those are the, the, the amazing human possibilities that we have to create a world where we start to honor each other's common humanity, whether we're little children, we're big adults, we all have things that happen to us on a daily basis. And to begin to understand that, for kids to see that the educator is a human being too, that they go home to a family, that someone's sick, that, that you know somebody's child is in the hospital, or that this kid was homeless and we didn't know it. All of these factors are things that are hidden. And not only are they below the, the, the water line, but they're really below our sight. And when that starts to happen, it's magic. It's not panacea, it doesn't happen every single time, but it does happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, just want to bring your attention to the fact that we included uh, an, an implementation guide um, for you all to review. Um, some of these myths and realities here on the, on the board have been um, kind of adapted from some of the ones that were mentioned in that, that guide. It's a really great guide. I think it was made in collaboration between the NEA and Denver Public Schools. Um, but, uh, but it also shows in there um, you know, the kinds of data that can be collected um, to, to ensure fidelity and ensure success. Um, it also talks about the roles of different people within a restorative process and, um, and from an administration standpoint, how best to ensure success of implementation. So I just invite you all to take a look. So um, what, what we've been discussing with Dr. McNeely uh, for a little while and, and uh, Principal, uh, su excuse me, Superintendent Andrew, is, is this idea of how could we support some of the schools that are most in need. And uh, like uh, Corey was sharing before, we, we work with Newberry um, and uh, Rawlings, Howard Bishop, Resilience. Um, and, and so we, we feel like we have the capacity to train four schools a year. And that would be uh, all the faculty and uh, ad some administrators. We also really feel like it would be helpful to train the, the bus drivers, cafeteria workers, the, um, the grounds people, et cetera, uh, looking really at a comprehensive of how is everyone building community and understanding the restorative language and the restorative process. So it, we believe it's in with, uh, within our capacity to go ahead and do four schools a year. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the dream for us is that the district, like, like uh, in Colorado and many other districts around the country, they have a dedicated staff person, uh, a restorative justice coordinator. So that would be the ideal, that's the dream, is that there's someone on your staff that can be trained by us that ultimately becomes the trainer. So it's a sustainability model and that they're available to, uh, as for intervention, for coaching, for facilitation and circles. Right now, we get called in to do some of these different circles. I don't know, I, I know you all unfortunately have had numerous different bomb threats, but uh, RPCP did facilitate one out of Buholtz a number of years ago uh, with one of those young men and we brought together some of the school board and law enforcement and community members. Um, and this incident that, that Corey was referring to where a young person hit a teacher and knocked her out and, um, and there was no reintegration. So the teacher saw the student a week later and was re-traumatized. It was very, very upsetting for her. And so ultimately we were called in to do a circle like that. There was a food fight and we brought in the students that were involved and the um, 
cafeteria staff. So ultimately, we want to train the, the team and uh, you know the local staff to be able to do those kinds of things. I also just want to bring your attention to the educator student dialogue. So dialogue is a component of restorative practices, and it's really um, born out of the DMC work that we've been doing in, in the, the city, particularly with Gainesville Police Department and Alaska County Sheriff's Office, that we developed a police youth dialogue. And so we brought together black uh, African-American youth and, and police, and we did that for probably eight years. So we adapted that particular model and brought it into schools. And so we've done it in probably at least eight different schools with great, great results. Um, and a lot of satisfaction between the students and, and the teachers. So that would be one of the other things that we would be offering uh, in, in this work. Um, and again, on-call mentoring, modeling, and support um, to just look at different ways of embedding that. Um, and I think that was really what we wanted to convey to you at this point, but open to a discussion. I know we had uh, uh, some important ideas and thoughts of what is accountability or what is tracking look like so we're open to your feedback questions concerns and and the possibility thank you to the staff for the information I'm gonna call for citizen input and then I'll bring it back to us so if there's anyone we have any phone calls no phone calls any citizen input you come to the um, to the lectern and give us your name Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, just listen um, and also be here in support of RPCP. We've been working together for almost 10 plus years now and um, hey. love, oh, sorry. My name is Addison Staples and I'm representing, I'm the executive director of ACES in Motion. Um, I, I really support the work that RPCP does and um, Jeffrey and I have been in collaboration. Actually, our first collaboration was with board member Abbott at, um, at her school at Bulware uh, around conflict resolution. We actually had it studied by UF professors and, and have reports on that, but that was our first introduction into some of this work. Um, but my comments here are to encourage the board and the district staff to really um, take a deep dive into the work of Dr. Bruce Perry and his company. Um, he has been one of the leading scientists and um, facilitators, professional practitioner into trauma. Um, he's developed a company called the Neurosequential Model. He's also developed the model and has begun training a division. At first, he started with therapists with the neurosequential model for therapists that's called NMT. But then they decided that needed to be in schools. And so they developed a portion of that neurosequential model for education, and that's called NME. The whole state of Arizona has adopted this as part of their behavior and their discipline um, framework. Um, dozens of other school districts have adopted this, even one, I think, here in Florida, one or two in Florida, but all over the country. And they have a division within Bruce Perry's um, company that assists districts in training all of their teachers, staff, ground workers, everybody. I just recently got trained by Dr. Bruce Perry, and um, they just started the second cohort of NM Sport. This is to train all coaches and rec um, players, but basically all coaches would then be trained in this work. Um, we are also developing a course that will be taught at UF in 2024 um, for NM Sport as well. I say all this to say that there are great people working in the schools. There's great people working on admin. Having a program such as Aces of Motion, where we have almost 10 different schools that kids come from every day, and, and to be honest, some of our most challenged students come to Aces of Motion, and I see all their behavior reports at the school, but within 10 years, maybe one fight 
at aces emotion, hardly any behavior issues at aces emotion, and it's due to the work that we have been doing with this science backed behind it. I know the schools are a different animal. We, everybody can't be this closed-knit system. However, um, I see all the different arrows pointing in so many different directions with each school. Each school has a different policy. Each school has a different approach. Each school has a different way they're shooting their arrow. And I see all these arrows shooting in so many different directions. I'm encouraging the, the board and the district to get all their arrows shooting in one direction. I would love this. They have a framework. And that framework has outcomes, such as many of the things that you were just talking about in your previous thing, such as staff and job satisfaction increase, staff retention rates increase, remain high, staff student connectivity to school increased as a safe and positive rewarding remains high. Student academic achievements are increased, remain high. Student time in classroom increased. The school experiences fewer student behavior incidents. School staff feel more competent, effective, and successful in their roles. The reduction in staff burnout and frustration related to student behavior and the cascade of effects behavior has on classroom management and academics. A cultural shift occurs at the school, meaning that not only the systems and practices at the school changed, but the understanding and expectation of the school to operate in a trauma-informed way is communicated and understood by all staff and families. There is a school-wide awareness of the understanding of NME core concepts. There's three other outcomes that I won't belabor the point is, but the, the main advocacy that I, I guess for public comment time would be to really adopt this model, but also to adopt a trauma lens. And it's really just brain science. It's, it's simple brain science, but putting into a layman's term or digestible term. And I think the book, What Happened to You, does it beautifully. Um, but there is a model and a framework that is scientifically proven with these outcomes that have proven, there is papers written to show these proven outcomes. Um, so, I thank you for your time. Thank you. I thank RPCP for the work they do, and I think the work that they do fits beautifully, and the work that I see in all the schools fits nicely into, the, into this framework, but we gotta get one central framework, one central policy, um, or else we're just gonna be all in different directions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Staples, for that. Um, I, I had a question for you, though. And part of you getting training for that, is that a train-the-trainer model? Because I'm trying to think of how we can use you with the trust. <laughs> yeah. It is a train-the-trainer model. However, you have to first get trained by their people. And then, I, you know, I, we just started uh, conversations with them for the NME just so that uh, I have no interest really in it, but to, to advocate it for because our, our students are in the system of the school. Um, they will come and present at a workshop, they'll come and present. Um, no, but I'm saying your training, I'm, I'm trying to figure out in the after school space, did you get trained so that you could train other people like in the booth circle, um, is that what you I'm did? allowed to use their material as a certificate as long as it gets approved by them in the way that I'm gonna be delivering it. Um, but um, in limited capacities, yes. Oh, okay. um, but I'm, yeah. I'm thinking I'm meeting with Marsha, that's why I asked, so yes. that's why. <laughs> But Thank you. <laughs> my advocacy also on the Children's Trust Board, if we can get them trained in this same model, the school district is the number one largest youth, out of school youth provider in the county. Y'all, y'all, I think quadruple the number of students compared to every other after school program in this county. So none of us hold a candle to the amount of time that y'all spend with students outside of school. If we can get the Children's Trust and the school district and the city and the county to agree on this framework, similar to the way the city just adopted a positive youth development framework, then ev almost every student that t is in the hands of adults in this county will have the same language, the same approach, the same, and that is huge for youth to be in that same language and same approach and not be confused by all these different strategies and methodologies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, pull it back. Um, any questions or from the board or? 
All right, Dr. McNeely, I'll start with you then. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I, I want to thank the restorative justice team for sharing with us and giving us the necessary information, including now citizen, um, Mr. Staples. We normally don't comment on our citizens, but I wanted to thank you um, for your words of encouragement. And I think that in as much that my colleagues have been for the, ever since they were sworn in, have been talking at different orientations and workshops about the delicate way of changing things when it comes to the discipline and behavior. And I've only read five pages <laughs> of what happened to you, and I'm already stuck. I can't wait for my spring break where I can have silence and have the book. And I want you to know that um, Dr. Bruce Perry uh, collaborated with Oprah Winfrey, and who can't be better than that person? Um, I've watched all of the videos now, um, very short um, vignettes, videos, but with the work that they have done in Arizona, Ohio, and Canada, I'm excited about what could happen here in Alachua County, and that we would be, and, and I did not know, Ms. Abbott, that you had been working with your school, with um, the team. So if we could possibly, Madam Chair, find some money at some point in time, and that it would be put on the agenda for um, a vote, I would love to see that, Superintendent Andrew. Uh, we need it. And in as much that um, the team has stated about the trauma and, and where we need to be going with this, four schools to start working with four schools, I think that's a tremendous amount of change that we can expect. And I think I just heard about everybody shooting the same arrow in the same direction. Yeah. I have to agree with that. And um, Mr. Delaney has cautioned that we can say everything we wanna say when we come back in session like we are. And I hope I can hear more from my colleagues because we can't talk outside and when we're on breaks, but I'm here to tell you that what we have seen and what you have produced and what you are willing to do is exactly what we need in our atmosphere. I want to be shooting the arrows in the same direction. I thank you again for exposing me personally to the team and learning that our schools have um, certainly entered into conversation. You have accountability where you're seeing the difference that the circles make. And for the children to be able to have that kind of interaction, I can only say thank you, thank you, thank you. Because so many times, Mr. Collins, as you stated, we send them home, they come back, we repeat again. This can unlock what we have needed so much. And not only am I wanting to see this trauma, brain, association, research, what is that long word, neuro, sequential model network, I think I've got it. I'm gonna even be working on that with my personal self and, and family. And my colleagues will probably say, and Ms. Green will say, thank you. So uh, I'm going to be doing that and trying my best. And 
if Mr. Delaney says we can pull circles together, then maybe that's what we need to be doing and listening to each other and resolving conflict. Thank you so much. And thank you. Um, I agree with everything Dr. McNeely has said. And of course, you all know I've been talking about behavior <laughs> since I've arrived. Uh, and the work that you do is extremely important. Um, as I said before, levels of interventions are important. And we have been doing that for so long, suspending kids, uh, bringing them back to school in the same situation, knowing they were going back to the same challenging environment. And so that's why when I first thought about, you know, the transitional school to success was that you pull those students, you work with them. Right now they're going out everywhere else and they're not a part of the Latra County Public Schools. But you got to bring those wraparound services to make the difference because when kids go to the different schools, every got, everybody got a different behavior policy. So as a kid and a parent, that is extremely, you know, frustrating. Uh, I see it on Wednesdays when they go to court. Well, this school over here said this, and this school said this over here. And so it's good. And, 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 and right now, I'm really, you know, with the team, like you said, it makes a difference. You know, you have to have a lot of patience. And I'm really pleased about what Ms. Uh, Bean is doing at AQUIM. She's taking those kids because those teachers want to be there. The staff, they want to be there. They understand. And so... All of us working together, that's why this is, and I'm glad you said, this is not just our problem, the city, the county, so I've reached out, and hopefully on April 10th, you know, we'll be having this discussion, um, because all of us need to be working together to make sure uh, this happens, because we have a lot of children uh, uh, in trauma, and who need us, and, uh, and academically, they need that place. Well, it's not punishment, but it's consequences. But even after that, we still care for you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm, he I'm here to help you do what you need to do to move on. So I'm glad that, and this, this would be a great partnership because uh, uh, enough is enough when it comes to the behavior, but what we all do uh, when it comes to behavior is gonna be extremely important. And when you make those kids feel like you care about them and you bring in the parent and don't judge uh, anybody and uh, it makes a world of a difference. So thank you. Um, I also wanna thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Dr. Perry's work is new to me, but neuroscience based approaches to behavior and collaborative approaches behave to behavior are not. Um, I've read the works of Dr. Ross Green and Dr. Mona Delahook, who are also neuroscience collaborative based behavior people. And um, when, when we were running for office, we were often asked, what are you gonna do about discipline? And my response was always, behavior is communication, which is what Dr. Green says. And it's com if a student is exhibiting behaviors that are not adaptive to their setting, it's because they have an unmet, unmet need or a lagging skill. And punishment-based approaches without wraparound services, without res restoration, don't address the unmet, me unmet needs or the lagging skills. Um, and that's why we're not seeing any movement in behavior, because we're punishing kids but we're not addressing the reasons behind the behavior, which you talked about with your iceberg analogy. Um, and so I see this as something we definitely need. Um, I see this as probably the, one of the highest priority things to use our money on, because as we all have discussed, when student behavior is out of control, we lose good staff members and we lose opportunities for academic instruction and growth. Um, and I think I'm gonna concur with Ms. McGraw. I hope that um, perhaps this can be, um, Chair Certain, perhaps this can be added to the joint meeting agenda for April 10th with um, Ms. Mr. Staples talked about, you know, getting not just the school district, but the city and the county involved so that we're all shooting our arrows at the same target. Um, but, but from my experience, both as a teacher and a parent, this is how I approach behavior problems um, with my own children and when I have a classroom with my students, even my college students. So um, I appreciate you and I support this plan.
Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to River Phoenix again. I say one thing that's, uh, before you start. Mm -hmm. um, I want to challenge each of you to get the book. Some of you will be in Tallahassee with the legislation um, committee. And um, when you come back, maybe we can figure out a way that the book can be purchased for you and that Mrs. Certain would call for a noticed meeting so that we can have um, a book review or whatever. I think it's important. And um, I think the superintendent will buy it for you all. Thank you, Ms. Certain. Thank you, Dr. McNeely. So I, um, I'll send you the videos. I have a link to the videos that Dr. McNeely is referring to. I've only watched the small, the short ones. I haven't seen the others, but I'll send it to everyone if, and you all could watch them if you're leisure. I haven't watched the longer one. But what I want to say, I think it is good if we, um, we have a knowledge of it, but I also want to caution us that that's operation. So you all have expressed interest in, in support of this. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm recalling from the ESSER amendment that we approved at the last minute, I mean the last meeting, there were funds set aside for training um, this River Phoenix. So I'm looking at Dr. Elbers and I want her to, to tell us if she can briefly, if I'm, or correct me or to confirm what I'm saying. So there is money set aside for PD. Um, it was, um, I guess, organized for different professional development needs that we have. Um, I don't know, I'd have to go back and look at because the, in the previous meeting prior to this um, workshop, there was a sharing of what the cost would be for those schools and what the continual cost would be because it wouldn't just each year, it, there's a certain cost that would have to be established and move forward that is not included in that plan for ESSER amendments. And so I think that um, we would have to look strategically at how we could train people within our district with restorative practices and how we could utilize that portion um, of financing. Is there PD money? Yes. Is There are outlines for, for PD that we need in specific areas. That's how we were able to tabulate what the cost for the PD would be. And this came after the fact. So we'd have to go back and address. Okay, so what I recall seeing in the amendment is not this, not what they put up there. That was something different because I was thinking it was already in the ESSER so amendment. So there were That's some things for restorative practices in general, but not to the, to the cost of what I believe that this is. And then there was also restorative justice that you saw because that is how Newberry was paid. So that was a portion of how we were able to bring the restorative justice practices to Newberry and have them go through that training. So just for question, um, there's been this talk of this plan and all, uh, the plan that's been, you've been talking, you've mentioned to the board, is anything that they've um, spoken about here today incorporated into the district-wide behavior plan and strategies there, for us going forward? There are definitely restorative practices within the district-wide plan in terms of the PD for summer, like that was mentioned at the last board meeting. and. As they were talking, I was thinking about in the development of that and how we bring trainers into those pieces because they don't have to be our trainers for that, right? And that's something that we are looking at. But again, we have to go back to the model and look at what it costs in order to do that and how we fit that into what is being established as an outline. And the plan for the district and having those frameworks, restorative practices are built in the amount of time it takes for each one of those trainings and how that's outlined in that day, I, I can't speak to what it costs for them to deliver that for the schools. I think when um, Mr. Weisberg talked to us earlier, he was talking about how um, managing the four schools was important, but we also had to note, right, like in every subsequent year, as we took on new schools, we would also have to pay the cost for those schools in each one of those years, right? Is that correct? Um, well, I believe what I may have said is that it costs $6,000 to train a school, and that would be training all of the people there, um, which I think is a pretty good deal, you know, considering how many staff could be trained. 
and then um, you know what our what our commitment is with that six thousand dollars is to conduct uh, at least two of the educator student dialogues for them to just experience that and for them to get uh, an idea of how they might be able to conduct that themselves and then uh, some direct facilitation and coaching and mentoring and then the next year um, we're not charging them again other than the the new staff have to be trained and that can be combined with other schools so it's it wouldn't be a recurring six thousand dollars per year you know but for the next four schools it would be another twenty four thousand yes for year, for right? yes yeah, six thousand dollars a school mm -hmm. you know so it's twenty four thousand for each year plus whatever that difference of cost is for the new staff that would come on for the schools that have already been paid for correct yes is that okay and so um looking at that and what the span of time it would be to cover the schools across the way and like is that a, a model and and we discussed um previously you know, in my thoughts when I was looking at what they shared in our previous meeting is how we utilize when they talk about training the trainer is how could you utilize potentially um, when you look at that cost, being able to have your school counselors be in places where they're able to do training because this is what they went to school for. They have master's degrees. They, this is what they do if they had time to do it. And so, um, you know, is it cost effective to be able to allow them to be the job, to do the job that we're already paying them to do and to become trainers and go through the training experience and then train at the schools that they're assigned at? Um, I don't know. When we look at the summer model, then it's a matter of if we are trying to um, develop a co consistent practices across the district, do we then use restorative practices and be able to have within that when we're focusing on the frameworks for the district to come in in summer and have restorative justice be trainers during the summer model but not necessarily adopting four different schools every single year i think we have to look at how that is mapped out so thank you i was asking um i really i thought i re recall seeing in the ESSER amendment that line item for them and i was just wanting to know like the extent of that and if this particular in framework was being incorporated into what was going forward with the district that was okay. all right well we have some stuff to hash out or whatever we we what I what dr. McNeely said in, in it was said in here the get all the errors going in the same direction that is really critical for any initiative not just discipline that's any initiative that the district undertakes and common goals and common language from the previous presentation i mean it kind of dovetails together and i but um you guys are more eloquently saying that than what i've been saying over my time sitting here and all so that i think that really is important um so we've, you've given us a lot to consider. We, um, the board ha is, is really wanting to support efforts to support our students and our staff because we do know that um, the rise in the trauma we've heard about as a result of the pandemic, as so just a, report, a result of just the children in their daily lives that they're experiencing and they're coming to school is something that we have to deal with. And um, Hopefully we all can come together and partner to, to really improve that, you know, support our staff, support our families, the students, and, you know, build community so folks, do, the students do feel more a part of, of the school district. And it does, it's not an adversarial relationship because we don't exist without students and their families. So, you know, so thank you all for coming today. Okay. Thank you, thank you right. so much. Yes. We just want to throw a big thank you to Ms. Green. I don't know if she's here or not, but thank her so much for the PowerPoint and putting together the uh, handouts for you all today. Who, who are you going to Ms. Pick? Kelly Green, is that her name, Dr. McNeely? Kim. Oh, Kim. Oh, thank you, Ms. Green. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're welcome. So uh, to my colleagues, I, I, I got to take a break. I need to, we got to take about five minutes, but let's come back in five, okay? And then we'll get Mr. Rella. We, we, this is really, really, hate your, back, hate your last, but I was, didn't want to like leave our guests for that, for them. <laughs>
I take longer than River Phoenix, so that's why I've flipped that and all. Okay, so thanks for your patience. And not, not a problem at all. You know, we're really excited um, today to be in front of the board to talk about our business services and custodial program. Um, of course, for us, it's been a it's been an area of great focus. Um, much like anything else, it seems in the district. Once you kind of scratch the surface, you see kind of um, you know, challenges on the outside, but once you scratch the surface, you start to realize there's a lot of underlying um, kind of structural inherent um, issues that need to be addressed. I can tell you, I speak for my team that we're really excited um, about the potential. I think, honestly, the custodial and, and building cleanliness is probably the biggest opportunity to increase um, the quality of the learning environment that I see. And of course, I'm not in the classroom every day. Uh, but we're really excited. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I do have Ms. Uh, Teresa Sperlingwood with us today. And our custodial coordinator, Ms. Natasha Bergman, was not able to make it. Um, I do want to acknowledge her efforts because she's been instrumental um, in helping us with the training program and kind of putting together these documents. Um, there is a lot of content. We're going to spend more time on certain items that we think are important than others. And I know we did provide the um, presentation in advance. Of course, there's questions that come up. We want to make sure we answer those. So just, and I should have mentioned it before, kind of what added to the length of the presentation was the fact that we've really never done a, any kind of presentation to the board on the custodial program. Um, it's, I don't want to say a forgotten area, but not something that's got a great deal of emphasis from the district. Um, in terms of you know attention and resources, um, it's a very small crew. So part of that is just kind of letting you know some of this is just kind of level setting the board so they understand what we do and why we do it, et cetera. Uh, so our facilities by the numbers, uh, 26,000 students, 53 facilities, including schools and ancillary, 461 buildings, and 260 custodians. We have 18, almost 1,900 classrooms, three and a half million square feet. Um, 362 relocatables, and then we have two district level support positions supporting that, um, the custodial area. So kind of our why, that's where we really wanted to start. Um, there's a lot of research that we've done in terms of the quality of the learning environment and the impact on the students, the teachers, the school. And we actually were in the district equity leadership team meeting on Monday when Antoine brought a lot of the research that we had already um, we had already kind of looked at, and we had a round table and discussed it, but it's really impactful, uh, much more so than you would think in terms of um, the learning experience for students, the allergies and stuff that kind of come um, with an unclean environment. Student attendance is huge, and most importantly, imp improved student performance on the teacher side of things. Again, very similar to students. Increased productivity, teacher retention, you know, a lot of the things that we've discussed, not just in this meeting, but in others. And just in general, you know, increases morale to have a cleaner building and health. Um, from the school side, it instills good habits. You know, when you see a, clean, a school that's clean, you want to keep it clean. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Parent involvement is huge. Um, and then just in general, just kind of promotes positivity within the school site. So as we were doing our evaluation, we kind of identified four kind of main tenets of a successful custodial program. Obviously, equipment is huge. So just like a teacher, we have to equip our custodial crew with the um, proper tools to do their job, adequate training. And then for me, the big one is program accountability. How are we doing inspections? How are we um, you know, handling that? And then constant evaluation of what we're doing and, is, and its effectiveness. Uh, we did spend, I think the custodial area has been, was moved to me maybe like two years ago? One, 2021. 2021. So the first thing that I wanted to do is a full evaluation of where we're at. I think that's a, a really big piece in terms of where we're going is knowing when you're at and seeing as it was kind of a new thing to me, um, I, we did do a full evaluation at this point. I'll turn it over to Ms. Sperlingwood to talk through some of the work we did. Can you hear me now? Uh, in 2021, 
we did a district-wide assessment of everything that we had going on. The condi condition of the custodial equipment was found to be at least 15 years old, terrible condition, disrepair. Um, we compared it with other districts and we were lacking minimum custodial equipment. At that time, there were ESSER funds available that we purchased custodial equipment with. Um, we reviewed the equipment with staff and we decided that it would be a great way to move forward by modernizing all of our equipment. Next slide. So at the 42 school sites, each one received some of the following equipment. It was funded by ESSER. Uh, the larger sites received two or more of each of the devices, and we'll go more into that. And then 20 sites received uh, pressure washers and walkway cleaning systems. And this was established in meeting with the principals, the head custodians, and all the staff, and finding out what they needed to improve their site. Um, in 2021-22, we actually put all the equipment into use. Jeff, Natasha, and myself went to every single school and cleaned for the custodial staff for their hands-on training a gang restroom or double restrooms for the cafeteria. So we demonstrated it on site with each team to make sure that everybody knew how to use the equipment and how much it could help them. Madam Chairman, can we stop? Or, or you rather questions afterwards? So let me ask them, um, what would you prefer? Would you prefer we, we wait or that we, and we kind of stop right then? So I'm always the type that wants to like discuss it when it's right then, okay. right then, uh, preferably. Makes sense. Okay. I'll make myself a note to go back to this particular page. Yeah. No, go ahead right oh, now. Oh, go do ahead. it now. No. No. Um, oh, thank you, Ms. Verlinwood, for all that you have to do. But I circle it. I've said it more than once. Please figure out a way to get rid of the waterless urinals in the schools, please. They cannot keep them clean. It's a horrible smell. Um, and I know for a fact, because I've been involved in those men's restrooms. Please. So that's facilities? Um, Dr. But, McNeil. but they no, clean no, no. it. I, I know, they clean it. And so your point's noted, but she can't change that. That's something. Go ahead, Mr. Rello. So we'll, I was going to say we'll certainly talk to the facilities, Mr. Molander. That's really um, kind of Lance in his area in terms of replacing um, those toilets. And I, I remember certain instances where they have been very difficult, uh, especially if they're not maintained properly. But we'll, we'll share that with Mr. Molander. And better still, go in them yourself mm -hmm. and say, like, they locked me up in one. And so that's all I've got to say. They locked you in a bathroom. I feel like we have bigger. They held the door where I couldn't get out. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, it's not funny, but it is. Funny. I'm <laughs> laughing at you because you, you ain't going to let them live that down. So on that note, at GHS right now, we're piloting some tablets that are enzyme tablets in the waterless urinals where we've only had them there like two weeks. So you can follow up with them um, when we get more information. Okay. And then we also purchased the boost machines to do the floor scrubbing to cut down on labor. They're battery powered. We did on-site trainings with those. So that is also part of the SRAF funds. Um, there's also additional training anytime a school needs, and we have video trainings as well. And the vendor comes out as well and if they need other training on that. Okay. We also reviewed our Florida Department of Education SREF reports, which is our state requirements for educational facilities. We found multiple violations on the reports. One of the bigger ones that is a very much a problem for the custodians was the toilet paper and paper towel dispensers, uh, storage, and the custodial sinks are too high for them to actually empty their mop buckets into. So. Um, we have a continuous problem with that and the floor drains. Um, we went through the custodial storage rooms. One of the problems with uh, COVID was storage, was more storage and things moved around, and the custodial areas. There, there needs to be a lot more addressed in custodial storage spaces. One of the next things with the uh, SRF violation, we cleaned out. 
230 tons of junk. And for those of you that want it in pounds, it's 460,000 pounds of stuff that was stored in schools. We're still working on that. That's 70 entire roll-offs that we've taken out, 78, so that the schools have more room for their stuff. Everybody likes to keep their stuff, but sometimes we have to start taking stuff out. Um, another thing is building design. We need some requirements for success in the future. Um, all the buildings need a walk-off matting area to keep the dirt from coming in the building to begin with. The same with covers to keep mud when it rains from coming in the buildings. Um, white and very light floor coverings in the entranceways and the hallways makes a lot more work for staff. Um, dedicated washer and dryer for custodians to use. I mean, some of the staff actually take the stuff home, and with COVID, that made it more of an issue. We're working on a rental program right now for rags and things. Um, shelving in all the custodial areas. Uh, the mop sinks, we're working on that. And, um, you know, having no place to wash containers out. And I did, did want to mention we've been working um, with Ms. Suzanne Wynn as we go through redevelopments and build new schools, et cetera, to make sure we're incorporating um, the design stuff, the design requirements that are going to make that team very successful. Um, and she's, her team's very receptive for that, so we appreciate her. You said, I'm sorry, you said rental program for rags? For mop heads and rags so that they, they don't have to keep reusing the same mop over and over and rag. Um, the, S, the SRF violations were also about chemical dispensing stations. We have now a chemical station installed in every site that has a sink because you have to have water for the chemical to be dispersed at the proper amount. Um, so that is in everywhere we can. We have a manual tra uh, annual training with the, the county for some mandatory training we have to have because of the DEP and the wax and stripper process. So that's being done. Next needs uh, condition of custodial carts is being reviewed. So if you think about 260 custodial carts and purchasing them or some other things, um, personal protection equipment, we're updating that. And we're piloting some backpack style vacuums, especially some battery powered ones because cords are just a lot of work in a school. I, um, I was reading this and I had circled in two spots the um, FISBIT trainings. Mm -hmm. And so I think we as an organization need to increase our trainings with that. At the last FISBIT meeting I was to, Alachua County didn't have a lot of trainings. I mean, so we, if you compared us to St. John's County, which had like 34,000 trainings, and I think we had less than 500. In the custodial program, we had 1,500 up to date. So I think, you know, obviously we're going to talk about training, Ms. Certain, um, but, you know, it's kind of difficult because all those, the, well, not difficult, but the FISBIT training, they're all done online, right? Like it's an online module. So one of the things we're doing is kind of putting in a small computer lab mm -hmm. at Duval so we can actually do some onboarding, do little stuff that the district doesn't necessarily do, like teach them how to look in Skyward, how to log on their email, how to enter a leave transaction, stuff that's really hands-on when we onboard those employees. And I think the idea of using the FISBIT modules, which already exist on slip and falls and workers' comp stuff, um, is a good investment, without a question. Um, also, we had the TikTok challenge. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that last year and the year before, where the students were challenged with removing devices from the walls. And we've done a complete district-wide upgrade. We're almost done replacing every paper towel and soap dispenser, I mean, paper towel and toilet paper dispenser so that everybody uses the same product. So if somebody needs to borrow from another site, everybody has the same size of product. And uh, that should make everything a lot easier for the custodians. They're also repairable. All right, so throughout this presentation, you're going to see a lot of references to Pasco County. So we've done... Um, some research and I'm really big on emulating others that are very effective. We don't need to start from ground zero and build it up. Um, two counties that we've looked at extensively are Pasco County and St. John's County. They actually operate very similar organizationally. 
but the Pasco County is, is crew um, is one that we've de developed a really good relationship with. They've been up to our county to train our folks with, I don't know, close to 10 folks that they're just bringing up for free, training our staff and doing evaluations. It's been a huge, huge resource for us, and they're incredibly effective. They're number one in the state um, on every list. So we did start with kind of like an independent review. They wanted to see where we're at. So they did um, site reviews at six of our um, elementary, middle, and high schools. And if you, I should have mentioned it before, but you can actually link through in a lot of these sections. You can link through and look at the reports if you want to. Um, I'm not going to talk about the grades. I will tell you they were not particularly good and um, a little uh, shocking in, in some respects. But it's like a you know 100 to 200 point inspection on everything. Um, so that's where we want to be eventually, but that kind of when it kind of grabbed our attention. Obviously, when we looked at some of the site reviews and um, the quality of where we were, we also did uh, one at GHS that made it part of the way through, and then um, they did help us with launching the vaccinator, which we're going to talk about. But they've been a very good partner, and we appreciate their assistance. Uh, they did have in their, I think it was three to four site visits. They did have some recommendations. Um, to provide equipment, et cetera, um, really heavy on training that wasn't necessarily taking place at the level it should be, a new employee onboarding, um, expectations, I mean, all this stuff that you would, you would expect. Organizational structure, which we're going to talk about, um, is not conducive for chain of command. And scheduling, which, again, we're going to talk about. And just in general, improving accountability, which is really important, and we don't have a great... Uh, Mr. Morello, let me ask you right quick. When it says provide adequate equipment and supplies for custodial staff, who's responsible for that? So it is typically a school-based budgetary decision. So is that based um, mainly the principal? Principal, yes. So, so do we have anybody like from Sibia Central to make sure? Because I know principals have a lot going on. And, and um, so I'm just asking, do we have anybody who helps? Supply. They, so they ha obviously, as you mentioned, have a lot going on as being instructional mm -hmm. leaders for their schools. Um, so I think you know part of what we want to do and part of the reason we did the evaluation is to look and see what's out there. Uh, but it, you know it's a school-based decision, but we admittedly don't provide enough funds. Like some of those, like the Boost floor machine is a five thousand dollar machine. That's what some schools spend um, a year and for you know well, toilet yeah, paper. Then I had someone tell me they they have to share a vacuum cleaner. You know, because you have to wait on somebody else to finish back. But I'm just saying, do, who's responsible? Because it is, you know, part of making sure the schools are clean. So I think uh, to answer that question, I would say it's a shared responsibility. Um, we have, I think, the district and the Casita coordination has a responsibility, and through me, in the budget process, to provide them with adequate resources. I mean, I think that's fundamental. Uh, but also, the school needs to use the funds in a way that we're not only just purchasing equipment, we're maintaining it. And you know, the bottom line is the staff needs to have what they need to clean the school. If we're not providing them with those things, how can we expect a positive result? So jumping into staffing, um, there is the Association of Physical Plant Managers uh, has different levels of cleanliness from orderly spotlessness, which is hospital grade, I guess you would say, cleaning. And for each of the levels, there's um, a custodian, kind of how much you can expect a, one custodian to be able to clean in an eight-hour shift. Uh, level one is orderly spotlessness. Level two is orderly tidiness. And we, in terms of staffing, um, we're at the orderly, uh, that level two. Um, I would say that I don't think in terms of uh, where we're at in, in cleanliness, we're on a level two, and that's a, certainly where we want to be because um, that's a nice, clean school environment. Uh, but, but then from there, obviously, the level of, of cleaning goes down and the quality of the cleaning goes down as well, so down to level five. Ms. Dorella, um, when a custodian is out, I know we try very hard to get a replacement, a sub, but you just mentioned in an eight-hour day, an individual employee should be able to do their work. But when we can't get subs, then normally the <clears throat> custodian who is at the lowest level will be placed to do 
that their work plus the person's work who's out. So you've identified a really important issue. So, and I think about it similarly to, you know, a, a bus driver, right? So they're serving students, right? So if they don't show up or whatever happens, they, they can't take their shift on a bus, then someone else has to pick up the slack. They've got to do a turnaround service, whatever the case is. The same thing applies, um, in my mind, in most student services area. Like, the work doesn't go away because the employee isn't there. But um, when you have that every day, I'm not saying a person is out one day. Right. He can handle mm -hmm. that. But when a colleague is out for whatever reason for a number of days, then it's prudent that everybody will maximize their time. And I'll get more into that when you get over to custodial staffing allocations and head custodian, because we all know what happens with the leader of all of the custodians. They open up early, well, and, and they open up early. So, yeah, I think, we, you know, we, we're going to talk through absenteeism because I think that's one of, our, one of our larger issues. But you're absolutely correct. When, in, when any kind of student service employee is absent, you're putting pressure on the staff that is coming to work. And I know, you know, we obviously, the board provides adequate leave um, and we're allowed to take it. Uh, but those that abuse said leave, um, obviously we've tried to pass contract language to improve that. But nonetheless, those are very, very important issues, and we certainly want input. I mean, that's the whole point of these workshops. So, um, But we're going to touch on all those things in a little bit more detail. So in term, and this is, again, I'm not going to, uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is the staffing. So this is our custodial staffing uh, manual allocation, and we base it off, um, the California CASBO model uh, a few years ago when we made some adjustments, but basically what the formula attempts to do is identify all of the areas that would lead um, or drive the need for custodial um, staffing and services. So it includes a personnel, the number of teachers, uh, students, the number of classrooms and the square footage. In addition to that, um, there is a community aspect to the schools where after hour stuff for, you know, obviously elementary is a lot less than middle and in, in high schools, it's constant. So they, we do provide additional um, custodians for, to, in recognition of that. And then the grounds piece for uh, the, you know, facilities, lawn maintenance portion is all, there's also a factor for that as well. And I did want to take a couple minutes, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but to define some roles quickly. So um, you have, we, have, we do have plant mechanics. I think we have 11 at our different schools, and they really serve as maintenance employees. They report to the director of maintenance, uh, but they are physically at the schools. They're doing, performing, um, you know, light maintenance work carpentry, masonry, plumbing, et cetera, um, and then working as a liaison between the maintenance staff, the trades, and um, really just on-site maintenance. And then you have the head custodian, which typically opens the building, as Dr. McNeely mentioned. And then they're also charged with setting up the schedule, um, performing some of the routine maintenance, and um, they're Can you give examples? Training staff. What that would look like, Mr. Rella or Ms. Sterling Woods. Specifically in what, in what way? Routine maintenance. So that, that would include like replacing light bulbs, replacing ballasts, replacing receptacles. And I should mention, and I've had the, the conversation with the superintendent also uh, with Mr. Molander, is like it's not really clear to staff who's in charge of what. And, you know, we see that with, like, the gutters. Like, is it the roofer's responsibility to clean the gutters? Is it the plant mechanic? They say it's the custodians. So I think a part of this process is going to be clearly delineating oh, good. who's in charge of what. And, again, that kind of goes back to accountability. But I, in defense of staff, I'm not sure we've done that work. Um, I'm not sure we've very clearly defined. You haven't. Who's it? Okay. 
Um, that sounds definitive, and I think and I think you're right because so, I couldn't find it. But I think that's really important. Um, so that's again, you know, this obviously is a huge lift, and we're just kind of getting this thing off the ground. Uh, but one that is one area that we we really need to figure out, and I've already had a couple conversations with Mr. Molander about that. Is his custodian responsible for water filters or that facility? Facility. Facility. The facilities. And then underneath the um, head custodian is a lead custodian. They typically serve as a shift custodian. So typically, and of course it's not this way across the board, but typically the head custodian's first in, they have a shift, and then the lead custodian comes in typically later than that, and they kind of supervise the afternoon, evening shift. Um, but essentially, you know, obviously the cleaning work is similar uh, between the lead custodian and the head custodian. And um, there's just a little bit more of a supervisory coordinator uh, kind of role with the lead custodian. And th th all this information came directly off the job description. This isn't me editorializing. This is on off the job description. You can click through and see the job description if you're interested. School grounds, we maintain 1,400 acres, which is a lot. Um, the maintenance department has a grounds crew or grounds crews that go and maintain our fields outside of the school. It's the responsibility of the school to maintain everything kind of within the perimeter fence. Um, and we have some schools, seven schools, that have their own custodial crew take care of the work with, and they purchase and maintain equipment. And then we have 31 schools, obviously the bulk of them, that have a contracted service that where they work with, you know, masters, lawn care, the different lawn care companies to, to maintain um, the grounds. And there's been, there, you know, there's benefits and drawbacks to that. Um, you know, the benefit is they can do, do all the work on the weekend. A contractor can. Obviously, we don't want them, you know, cleaning or mowing GHS in the middle of a Cambridge exam. Um, so they do a lot of the work on the weekends and after hours, which is nice. Um, they do have profit built in. Uh, could we could we have a grounds crew? I know or expand our crew. Um, I know that's what Pasco does. They have a grounds crew that they take care of all the lawn maintenance, which is again that gives you a lot more control. And there's a lot. The bottom line is there's a lot of stuff that we don't do. Like we don't do like landscaping. Um, and you know you have schools that like where my kids go that are 30 years old and it's like the same shrubs I would imagine that were planted there 30 years ago and they don't look real great but I think you know there's certainly an opportunity to improve curb appeal with our schools and the curb appeal is so important I live near school and so I see it every day when I'm coming and going and my neighbors because I'm an elected official with the school board they're on my back constantly so the custodians can't get all of that they have to clean but they can't get all of the um, fence line stuff done so it's truly growing and I understand they don't have the time because they are concentrating on the school building so it's not the maintenance department it's still back on the individual schools, right? It, it is, and I think um, that's kind of problematic for schools because, again, I, you know, I do the budget, so I know they don't have money to do it. I mean, I no. can tell you right now, most, most of the schools don't have money to do all the PD and all the discretionary stuff, do the custodial equipment, and do, um, you know, any kind of landscaping. It's just not feasible. So I think we, you know, there's, again, like I said at the beginning, I think this is a huge opportunity for the district to improve. And, of course, we're coming with a lot of problems. We're coming with hopefully some solutions as well that will be suitable. Uh, but just really kind of starting the conversation on that. But I think, you know, that's, and, again, I get to a lot of schools, and it, it, I think we could get a pretty good return on investment if we'd improve that. And, again, when you walk in the building, it's like first impressions, everything, right? So... Yeah, I, I wanted to add when we leave things like grounds and landscaping to the individual schools, we end up with huge disparities. So schools that have very active PTAs will raise money to purchase landscaping and have a volunteer day to beautify the campus. 
and schools that don't have active PTAs end up with nothing. So having some sort of district-wide system for that would help with that disparity. Agreed. So for the contracted services piece, uh, we allow schools to convert, budgetarily convert a custodial position to contracted services, and that's kind of how they pay for the lawn care. So they'll either convert a full unit at 22000 or a half unit at 11000 and then use those dollars to uh, pay the lawn care service and other things. Uh, one thing I did want to note is we haven't increased this amount since I've I think probably been employed here, so it's at least 16, 17 years. And my what, note, my, I have a note yeah. that to ask about that. Yeah, so we've never changed it, and obviously the cost of the position has gone up, especially this year, a lot more. I'm sure that was the cost of the position maybe back in 2005, five, six, uh, But that's changed a lot, but not only that, the cost of the service has changed a lot. So your lawn care service has gone up tremendously. Um, so that's one thing that I know Mr. Um, Andrew and I discussed is maybe looking at increasing that conversion. So um, it's not just paying for lawn care, but then you can do some power washing, some floor care, and different stuff that um, really help the custodial crew in, in school beautification. All right, so opportunities for improvement. Uh, we've already touched on some. There's certainly plenty of areas that we've identified um, that I think, you know, Again, I think we this is one area we can really improve our schools, and we're excited to do the work. Um, jumping right in, our organizational structure um, is incredibly siloed. We have the plant mechanics, which report to the director of facilities and operations. The principals supervise the head custodians and shift and lead custodians, and they kind of report to, not kind of, they report to uh, the chief of curriculum. And then you have the chief of finance who's responsible for uh, the coordination efforts. So it's really three divisions. There's no clear um, chain of command that I would like to see. Um, and I'm not sure how to fix it necessarily. We do have some highly effective districts and how they do it. Uh, but I think in general, it's not conductive for having a really coordinated effort. Um, and you could, you know, you could look at like even like a food service division, you know, they, they have school, school based personnel and it's, you know, it's very decentralized, incredibly decent, you know, we got 40 schools and ancillary sites, uh, but they managed to coordinate all of those efforts and, you know, of course, Maria does a fantastic job, uh, but we don't have the human capital. Like when you look at our custodial office, it's Ms. Burlingwood, um, Natasha, and then we have one lead, so we have really three people to coordinate this massive thing, um, and it's not it's not possible with the organizational structure, and it's not possible with the human capital. So um, I looked at this when I got my slide deck the other day, and I got to this slide, and I grabbed my head like the reaction I just had a few minutes ago. But so my recommendation and from what it needs to happen is all of this needs to be com com combined. And I think the model, what I immediately thought of when I saw this is I thought of food and nutrition, how they operate. That is the model that we need to have for um, our custodial services. Because even though we have all the different sites and they're, they're remote, but we still have the person who's over them. And, and we already have people. We don't need to create another position. So that's not what I'm advocating. I don't want that to be misconstrued. I think we need to reevaluate how, like those three lines of things, that, that's why nothing's getting done, and that's why it's done well in some areas, and it's not done well in other areas. But I'm not going to pull on it, but I know that's on a different slide of what you're asking, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now. We can cut to the chase of all of this by changing the organizational structure. We know what it takes to get this done. You ain't need to come to us for that. Y'all know what to do. Just do it. Just do it. Like, act like a tennis shoe. Just do it. That, that song, that's what they say. Just do it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm just. I'm, I got on my soapbox. So this really like aggravated me, because I, I, my first experience at an SI school after being elected, I was at Williams, and the person from the DOE said the separate and unequal facilities in this school are very apparent. 
I wasn't going to say nothing. Like, I saw it. Ms. Jones could tell you. When I used to go, to, I didn't say nothing. I know y'all find it hard to believe. I used to just walk. I said, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to learn because I didn't know. I felt like I needed to learn before I just sprouted off at the mouth. But when the, my first visit at the SI school was the first, the beginning of the year, if they had us a longer visit. And that is what Dustin Sims said when we broke out in our group. He, when we were doing things that glow and things that need to grow, he said the separate and unequal facilities in here in this school building, our parent, because we were in the magnet hall, and it was very light and bright, and the floors were clean, you could eat off of. And where the major program, the neighborhood kids, where it was dirty and it was dark. It was dark. And, I, and in my notes, I could show it to you. I, I had wrote, this hallway is dark. So I was sitting there, and I'm like, how am I going to bring this out? And that's what he said. So that is a problem. And we know it's a problem. So people like the turf garden and the wanting to do this, that just got to stop. And we got to consolidate this. I got another slide I'll probably go off on. Okay. Right. So I think, you know, what we're trying to do, obviously we're showing the board, like this is, this is where we're at and here's how we get there uh, based on the direction. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously when I, I had to do this slide, so when I'm looking at it, I'm just like, it's painful, but it, it kind of lets you know why we are where we're at, but we're going to fix it. We promise. Uh, so I think we've, I think Ms. Certain touched on most of the stuff. The only thing I would say is it's really difficult to be an instructional leader and maintain um, the level of the HR involvement, the hiring, onboarding, and oversight. It's just really, it puts a lot of stress on our, t on our uh, school administrators, and we would like to take that um, over. We want them focused in the classroom, not, you know, fielding complaints from various teachers, et cetera. We, but we need someone on site that's going to do it, do the work. Uh, so this is the PASCO organizational chart. So we have 53 facilities. They have 98. So we're basically double their size. Or I'm sorry, they're double our size. So this is kind of how they're organized. They have the director of maintenance services. And I think Ro it's Roger. Roger has these custodial area specialists, let's see, five of them. And then the, they kind of supervise the plant managers and the plant managers supervise soup to nuts, the custodial areas of the schools. Um, but this actually organizationally is very similar to how Maria operates. She has kind of zone folks that you know are there and then she has her, um, her food service manager who supervises the employees, et cetera. It's all done on site, and there's an incredible amount of training to be provided. So this is, I think, eventually kind of where we need to be moving towards. Um, obviously, they have a training specialist and a lot of stuff that would be nice to have. <clears throat> but just organizationally, this is a really good model. Um, so this is obviously something we would like to emulate over a period of time. And how they got there, uh, they hired two of the area specialists in 2003, and they were, or 2013, they were in a very similar place we were, and they made improvements and it kind of implemented this. They added two in 2013, two more area specialists in, in 2014, and kind of went from there, but they built it up over a period of time, which is our recommendation. And just kind of delineating or explaining the role of the plant manager even further. They're really responsible. They're on site and they are responsible for the building, the employees. They supervise, hire, evaluate all the custodial staff. They do all the training. Uh, they typically, in large part, operate similar to our head custodian where they're doing the schedules, they do the ordering. Um, but this this specific person in um, and PASCO has the full responsibility. Like they are evaluated based on those rubrics that we share with PASCO and graded on how well they're doing on that 200 point inspection monthly. Um, so there's a lot more oversight, but this is obviously a higher level position and you know, responsible for the day to day operations. Mr. Rella, the plant manager for PASCO, is it like a zone and they have so many schools up under them? It's not one at each, it's one at each school? It's one at each school. Okay. So, and that's exactly what um, St. John's does. They have someone that's on site, that's soup to nuts, does the whole thing. So the plant manager is similar to how we treat a head custodian now? I, I think operationally, in terms of the responsibilities for the most part, um, our head custodians don't get involved with the HR aspects as much. I'm sure they're included, but they're not doing 
um, evaluations directly and stuff like that. So it would be, it's kind of like a, you know, increasing that position to something higher and with a lot more responsibility and importance. So the, oops. So the plant, none of this changes the plant mechanics job, but where do they fall in the org chart? Well, I, I think, and there's a reason I listed the plant mechanics, I think you'd be perhaps duplicating efforts if we had both. Um, so I think there needs to be some consideration to how we um, maybe merge those responsibilities because a lot of the responsibilities the plant, man plant manager for PASCO is doing a lot of the stuff that our plant mechanics are doing now. So there's kind of like a blended um, duties, but um, there certainly has to be some discussion because I don't think obviously you need a plant manager and a plant mechanic at every school. So does, so right now our plant, we don't have a plant mechanic at every school. They're like a handyman type job that goes from school to school. They do repairs that are just below what we would call in trades to do, right? So they're, they're uh, typically at one school or a sister school, so they're assigned to a school. So oh, the example okay. would be like uh, Fort Clark, ha Fort Clark and Hidden Oak share a plant mechanic, so they're obviously the adjacent. Oh, but they're supposed to do a lot of the you know normal routine maintenance type um, duties, okay. but not any real supervisory duties. And then also again, like supervise, you know, from afar. So, so does PASCO have anything like in between trades and their plant manager? Because I'm just, so in, in the districts that I worked in, we had um, something like a plant mechanic in some districts, it was called the zone mechanic, but they weren't assigned to one or two schools. They were assigned to like six or eight schools, um, maybe even more than that. Um, and they did kind of, repairs that were beyond the scope of custodian but but below the scope of trades so i'm i'm just thinking where does that kind of thing fall in our projected new so the, the we do we have we have a zone foreman who operate exactly like you're talking so they have a team of trades and they you know daily are delegating work orders and they're kind of addressing their schools so that's kind of the seems similar so they're really doing the stuff that's over and above what would be done by a plan mechanic or a custodian, um, but the you know the plan mechanics like eyes on the ground, you know assessing and stuff. Um, I did update this this morning. I found some some errors, <laughs> unfortunately, um, which I always do when I look at it the day of. Uh, but we did some benchmarking, and the numbers that have been updated are on the Pasco schools side. So I'm just kind of throwing this out there so you can kind of see for our plant mechanic, as of right now, 1968 an hour, um, head custodian, 1737. And these are beginning pay numbers and then lead and custodian. And then you can see the starting um, hourly for the plant manager at Pasco. They do have um, a couple things I wanted to mention here and it's hot link, but they have for their Elementary, it's kind of like a base plant mechanic, and then if you supervise a school, a larger school, like a middle school, you get a bump, and if you do a high school, you get another bump. So it's kind of reflective of how many people you're supervising, how big is the plant itself, et cetera. Um, so we do think that's a good model, because like that's if you're at you know, GHS versus Shell, those are very different positions, right? So, um, but I did want to kind of just show you, this is how much, you know, on, for beginning pay, how how much um, those make so I mean in terms of salary I think we're we're right there and competitive in terms of what we pay versus what they pay uh, so I just wanted to make sure the board saw this um, absenteeism so we have seen a lot of absenteeism in all areas um, in our research we did pull the absenteeism absenteeism specifically for the custodial area for the reasons that dr mcneely mentioned it's very disruptive and it's a challenge um incredible amount of leave it's a large staff of course but uh, the, it was interesting when the leave was taken um especially like during the summer which is our most important period when of course there's no students there we're getting all the big heavy lifting strip wax and floor cleaning stuff done it's, typically when the most leave is taken, unfortunately, um, especially in August when the students get back, like that's when we, I, I mean, we have school leaders in here, like that's the first couple weeks of school is, and before school starts, pre-planning is extremely busy. 
So staffing shortages, I'm sorry. So if you go back to that chronic absenteeism chart, I just real quick pulled up a COVID rates chart for Florida. It matches the waves of absenteeism almost exactly. Does it? Yep. So this, and I should have mentioned, it doesn't ex um, include like holidays or anything like that. This is like leave taken, paid or unpaid vacation. So that's certainly, there's a potential for that to be COVID related. Did this, I was wondering if it was around the holidays, like the November, December, January, or I mean, August is a high month, but I was wondering if it was like long weekends around the, the break. So like Thanksgiving, we're out every week. You filtered that week out, correct? And this is just for the three weeks of November that we're in school. So it would have been for a scheduled work day. So for like 12-month employees, we work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Monday, Tuesday for Thanksgiving week. A lot of people take that week off entirely, but we're supposed to report. So basically, it's a scheduled work day and leave taken. It doesn't include like, you know, the, the vacation leave for the uh, the winter break where they're pull, we're pulling back 40 hours, et cetera. It's really just a scheduled work day and the hours taken. Mm -hmm. okay. Is it not possible for the administration, um, especially during the cleaning, when, when school's not in, in the summer, especially when summer school is over, custodians want to take their vacation time and I always try to provide them with that, but all hands had to be on deck to get the school clean first, and then we started talking about leave. I think if administration gave them that opportunity to say, all right, then when school starts, you're gonna be off for the first week or whatever, but you cannot take off during the summer months. Until we get that in our heads, it's not gonna work. In order to have the school perfectly clean, you cannot take off doing, I'm looking here at the biggest, the 5,000 and some hours in August. July and August are your days that you need people to be there. I don't, I don't, I don't see why not negotiating. Well, not that it wasn't the word I need to use. Not negotiate. Just say I need you here. And when you have that kind of connection with your people, they'll be there. I'm not saying now if you're sick, that's a different thing. But I'm saying who wanted to be off two weeks for vacation during this critical period of time, no. There's, I mean, again, just like a bus driver, there's no really good time to take off because like, if you're taking off during the school year, you know, then we have the issues you mentioned. If you're taking off during the summer, then we're kind of getting behind. Um, we, didn't, we didn't take off in the summer, period. You just, we just didn't do that, and I smile. Um, Ms. Ward. You just turned it off. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so we are talking about leave that's earned. And there is, as Mr. Rella said, there's really no great time to miss work. But they, they definitely earn and deserve their vaca a vacation leave when they work 12 months out of the year. And so I understand your point that that's the time that a deep clean can happen and the teams have to, they have to stagger their leaves. Like that can work and it has worked. But I think it's, it's also, this is hours. It seems like an overwhelming amount of hours and it's, not quite as um, daunting if you look at it per, as days, because most of those custodial positions are eight hour work days, but that's all I have, thanks. That's the, that's the next slide. That's the next slide. But, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm at the middle between where you and Dr. McNeely are, like when I worked on a paid job. <laughs> we had um, times where, you know, 
even though I earned leave, I knew it was going to be really hard for me to be off because of the, the my responsibilities, my work responsibilities, and so we or and we, it was staggered leave with staff, and that's what we kind of have to go to because really, our everyone is here to serve the students. The investments that are being made, like I heard it said. Elijah County School District is the largest employer. Yeah, but we employ people so that they can educate students, and in this case, the, the staff here, they're taking care of the facility. So we have to keep that in mind, and whatever we earn and we get, it is at the, um, at the expense or at the benefit. They're, they're providing a service to the school district, but the school district is paying them so that we can operate and serve our students, and that has to be um, front and center of everything that we do. Madam Chair, I, I certainly don't want anyone leaving this room thinking I did not allow custodians to have their leave. No, you just wanted your school clean. And, and they took it in June and they took it in September. Those were the months that were not impacted, but they had their two weeks leave. I didn't want anybody to say McNeely didn't let custodians take that. That's not the case. but. We knew June was your time to put in, and September, your two weeks. You wanted two weeks. Everybody wanted two weeks, so, but you needed to be there in July and August, period. Okay, so <laughs> kind of, <laughs> so moving on to the, um, kind of like looking out on a daily basis, and this in some ways is oversimplification, but it does illustrate a point, obviously, which is why we made a slide. So the average custodian takes about 25 and a half days. I'm sorry, the average daily leave is 25 and a half positions, and the average annual leave per custodian is 23.3, um, so that's basically on any given day, <clears throat> that's nine per, over 9% of our workforce that's not there. Um, kind of adding to that issue on a daily basis, we have, uh, or at least when I took this snapshot, we had seven employees out on FMLA or other extended leave. We had 11 vacancies and we had four positions on workers' comps. And when you kind of add all those together on any given day, we're down almost 50 positions um, across the district. And kind of going back to the point that's been made a few times here, like when that work isn't done, you're adding, um, you know, additional work to others, but it really puts us behind the eight ball. And I know, you know, substitutes, you know, some people have been clamoring for those. They're having the same staffing issues we have, but they can't staff 50 positions a day. It's just not going to happen. Um, so to me, this, you know, this slide is important because it just shows you on any given day how far behind we are before the day even starts. In some days, like before holidays, it's probably over 100 because a lot of people tend to take off around holidays to wrap around. So um, it's just, you know, the absenteeism and, of course, vacancies that happen periodically are a challenge that we deal with daily in schools and in departments. Um, so the other one of the biggest issues that we found in our research is looking at how we schedule our custodians, which... Um, is drastically different than how I would as, would have assumed we did, I would say. Um, so just looking at, and again, this is a comparison between PASCO, which is the model, and Alachia County Public Schools, which we have a lot of work to do. But you can see during the school day, about 30% of their hours, scheduled hours, are during the school day. After school, it's 70%. And we're basically flip-flopped. So we have all of our custodians, not all, but most of our manpower is, is during the school day when students and teachers are in classrooms and we can't clean. Did you, that, that's you, a major fundamental kind of issue for me in terms of how we schedule them um, and you know, having them there when we need them. And I think you know, obviously this is a heavy lift. I think the challenges arise. Unfortunately, we have a lot of these employees in multiple jobs. So... They probably work for us during the day, the morning shifts, maybe go to UF Shands in the evening. Um, but it's a really big operational issue for us in, you know, driving a lot of the issues that I think I'm seeing in terms of ability to clean the square footage in a reasonable amount of time. 
Do going back, Pasco County is not quite twice the size of Alachua County. Is that right? I think there are ninety eight facilities, and we're at fifty three. So I mean, it's roughly but, yeah. The rough but we're at considerably less than half their staffing. So that's another issue. I mean, I'm not saying that the allocation of hours between school day and after school isn't an issue, but I'm also seeing a discrepancy in the number of custodial staff we have. Right, and it, you know, obviously it, it really goes back to square footage and students. I mean, the number of facilities is important, but how many schools you have, how many departments. Um, we did actually, I pulled their staffing formula just to kind of see where we were at. There's this maybe like a little bit more rich, but not, you know, significantly like to where I was just like, wow, that's a lot more. I think, you know, when you look at our staffing, they're pretty close. I think we could improve in some ways, uh, but I didn't see a big disparity in terms of how we staff versus how they staff. I think they're a lot more effective. Obviously, they're getting a lot more cleaning done when there's no students, so that helps tremendously. Um, and then I pulled... We asked PASCO for a sample of their one of their schedules, and I pulled one of ours from one of our schools, elementary schools that won't be named. Uh, but this is generally how most schools are scheduled in elementary. So you've got for PASCO, plant, plant manager comes in, 6.30 opens the building, make sure the HVAC's working, make sure the alarms are off, et cetera. Another custodian comes in um, to assist, and both of those employees work through lunch, work through um, essentially the end of school, but you'll notice that they have one, two, three, four, five custodians that don't come in till one or two o'clock, and then they clean in the evening, of course, when there's no one there, and then when you look at our schedule for this elementary school, ex almost exactly flip-flop, our head custodian comes in, again, to open up the building, another custodian comes in to assist with breakfast, lunch, et cetera, and then the balance of them come in at 9.30, <clears throat> when school is in session, and then we're only getting that period for an elementary school, you know, really between two and six to clean the school, to clean the classrooms, which is the most important, in my opinion. Um, and then, of course, we contract out lawn care. I th for me, it's a good visual to see how different we are and how the schedule, you know, really needs to be adjusted. And again, these are very difficult conversations to have, um, but I think those are conversations we need to have. I think we have to transition to having more hours outside of the school day so that the facilities can be cleaned adequately because um, I'm seeing some floors that are like in new schools that are not clean. That ain't, that's not good. And that's, you know, the flooring. And I know the floors have to, you can't have people walking on the floors once you clean them. So, and they got to have enough time to at the end of their work day so we're not encountering um, overtime for them to be able to do that. So that is something I think to be more efficient and to use the resources, these these particular dollars that we're spending more effectively. Yep. We did do some benchmarking and I've shared this with the budget committee. I did ask Ad Pasco just to kind of see, because I'm a numbers guy, to see how much we're spending, um, you know, for operation of plant, which is going to be your all your custodial staff, your cost of utilities, um, and other, you know, smaller things. But how much are we spending per square foot, um, which is interesting, and then also maintenance per square foot. So you can see for us uh, total square footage, and I did grab. Like Leon, Okaloosa, and Santa Rosa, they're our best comp in terms of school district size. Leon's our best comp for size and demographics. But I did include Pasco. Uh, there are economies of scale that go along with having a really big district. Uh, but in terms of like kind of where we land, you can see we're kind of at the high end for cost per square foot. You know, we do have some facilities that are underutilized, which is probably adding to that. And then the cost per FTE was even more disparaging in, t in terms of the difference. We spent a lot more for operation of plant um, than our counterparts, um, significantly more than some. So this that's I just I, my point, I guess, was just like it's not a lack of resources necessarily being devoted, uh, but efficiency in how we operate would put a period on that sentence. Uh, I did, again, more research that was done here. So I was kind of curious, or we were curious to see how much is spent on custodial supplies versus how much is allocated. And I was blown away 
and uh, not in a good way. Um, and I pulled basically for the three levels, elementary, middle, and high. And then, you know, going back to 2015, 16, and kind of two-year increments, how much we've actually spent. Um, middle's always been, for whatever reason, our highest spend per student. And this is all on a per-student basis. Uh, but you can see that steady increase, which I did anticipate an increase. I did not expect to see what I saw for 21, 22. Uh, we did have a lot of the stuff that's mentioned before in the TikTok. We did, you know, have a lot going on with um, the coronavirus. We did pay for all the PPE, so it's not like PPE necessarily that would be included. This is just general fund allocated dollars. But you can see how much we we allocate for custodial is woefully under what's actually required. So that's one um, of the things we're going to be discussing as we go through the budget process. We need, we need to provide them with adequate resources and make sure they're spending it on custodial and nothing else. Because um, that is a lot of the complaints we have. We don't have, you know, mop heads and the stuff and the supplies. And it's like, when I look at this, I'm like, well, yeah, that's our fault. It's my fault. Yeah. Um, this is the other slide here that I was like, why is our allocation it needs to be readjusted. You know, I've had this conversation with you, but because of a janitor telling me she had to buy her own garbage bags because they were being rationed out. And that's a no-no. That she, the lowest paid employee shouldn't be doing that. We should provide what they need. So I'm, I am big on that. But when I saw this and I saw the allocation, every single year there, they were spending more than the allocation. So to me, I think at budget-wise and the finance person, we need to look at how, our allocation, is it too low or is it waste? So I looked at middle school, and middle school is more spending more in high school. And I was like, wait, what? And the high schools have, all of our high schools are bigger than the middle schools, have more students. Right, and it's, and, you know, it's a per-student thing. I, you know, I, and I looked at all the individual schools, they're all over the place. So for me, my first concern is like, are we, you know, wasting products, is product disappearing? It's really hard for me to tell that from the numbers, but I will say the numbers in terms of how much different schools are spending is kind of all over, the, and that's always been the case, is I would get a call from friends like, hey, what's going on with my custodial budget? We're spending way more, I feel like, than other schools, and I pull the other schools, and they're all kind of all over the place. So um, it's a challenge to, you know, maintain those supplies. Um, you know, they're well, stored. Why, and That's why I asked earlier, who's monitoring? Who, who, who's really monitoring so, it? Because I just think that's a lot for right. the teachers. But if you want to talk about saving money or making sure everybody has who we need, is there anybody that can monitor that better? I mean, even with you being the CFO, right? I mean, you're not in the school every single day, but who's really monitoring? To it's me? really sh it's supposed to be, you know, job description wise, the head custodian. Um, I'm sure some are really, really good at it, and like he probably can't pull out a trash bag without any of them knowing. Uh, but that's probably not consistent across the board. And again, that's another reason to have someone on site that has the responsibility to do all of those things. And, and another thing will help with uniformity. You have so many different products over mm -hmm. time, different paper products, different mold products, different cleaning products that everybody was purchasing now that we're putting everything into one line we can now tell who's mm -hmm. actually using you mean like the principals purchasing different things we you say everybody's all over. well different schools and different custodial crews maybe they came from uf or they came from another district and they really liked x product but the, the x but product the principal is making expensive. that decision right the principals with in, input from the That's custodial team but it really the, the direction needs to come from the district like this is what we purchase this is how these are the mop right. heads these that's are what i'm saying they're, they're 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 principals and that's what i'm saying we're you know i wouldn't know you know in my i i, I hired somebody in my own business to tell me about what's the best cleaning thing because you got because that's not my field of expertise that's what i'm saying yep and we have okay. some thoughts on how to accomplish that district-wide that's coming Training. Um, I did want, I because I can't help myself, um, I put a slide on the importance of school culture and the broken window theory of crime. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Um, you know, obviously, if there's a broken window in a community, regardless of the community, there tends to be more crime. It's really a crime specific thing, but it's really a human psychology thing that comes into play in theory. And I think Although this is about crime, I think it has a complete application 
with our custodial area and just in general because the school culture dictates a lot of things. Like if I see, you know, little Mr. Shellnut throwing a piece of trash on the ground, which I know, I I know for a fact he would never, ever do, um, I'm, more, I'm more likely to do that. And how the community and culture of the school um, is built is through that. So I think a lot of it, a lot of the frustration from the custodial crews is people just throwing trash on the ground, putting gum on the ground. Um, and so I don't not necessarily how to fix that, uh, but I think that's something that needs to come into the conversation. And, and you can see it with different schools, like you get a, you know, a GHS or there's huge disparities just based on the culture of the school. Um, so how do, we, how do we make that into a district program? I think it happens over a period of time. Uh, but I did want to mention that because I think this is a really important part of the equation for the, for the cleanliness of the schools, how much the kids care, how much the staff cares um, is important. So we're revising the custodial manuals. Uh, Natasha and I have been working. Is your mic broken? Hello? Okay, sorry. So we're revising the custodial <coughs> manuals. Natasha and I have been working on that very hard. Um, we have a draft almost ready, and then we'll seek input from everybody on that. But a lot of the old manuals have stuff about chalkboards, a lot of different things that we no longer do. They didn't have a lot of the equipment, the electronics, the things we're doing. So um, the, with the trainings coming up, we're going to do the train-the-trainer model with the head custodian, similar to how Pasco's doing that. Um, and we are using the FISBIT Safe Schools Online um, I've been talking with Pam Smith, and we've reset that up again. Um, they have a lot of amazing things, especially when we onboard. Free units. It's free. It's free. It's a vector well, solution. I mean, free, now, it's not free. free, but we pay our our premium, so it's Correct. free. Correct. It has the asbestos, it. the PPE, the safe everything. schools, everything. Um, then the head custodians develop in a non-instructional professional development. There's not a lot of stuff for non-instructional. and. Uh, Maybe something with the River Phoenix for conflict resolution would be a good class for that. Just just a thought as they were talking. Everybody's laughing. You mean um, between staff? You're talking about between staff is what you're saying, yes. working together and all? Yes. Yeah. And I think that starts with, with the leader, you know, with the, the leader of the okay. and the, the um, one of the things, um, Teresa Sperling would that when you are doing your training, and I heard you say, if it's possible, that some of the circles and restorative justice, fine. But the head people who lead the others, they have to learn how to speak and talk to their employees. It's a problem. And those Little custodians, when I say little, the ones who are way down, not a lead, not a head, they are too afraid to say anything. So they just take it. Yeah. I've been trying to encourage some of those kind of people, or those pe I shouldn't say kind of people, those persons who are employed under the head and the lead. If you can't say something nice, you better get to your administration and report it. And they don't want to do it because they don't want a 24-hour notice. They don't want to get discipline in any manner. So it's a horrible situation to be in. And I don't think any of us sitting in here would allow it. I know I wouldn't. But they don't have other jobs that they can go to. So they have to accept it. Please place that top priority in your training. Um, we've established a new uh, hire onboarding schedule, and we've just put in a computer lab at Duval to help with the FISBIT training and uh, the Skyward training, because a lot of times we find that you know, getting onto the school board website and finding all the things and getting it set up in the email and stuff, it takes a little um, more encouragement to use all the things we're giving them. Um, the schedule for the new hire training, the first one will be March 23rd, 
And that is our mandatory training with the county that, every, that all the new hires will have. And then April 18th and 19th, we'll do a head and lead custodian training. And, and then you guys have the rest of the schedule. Um, we launched a district-wide flat mopping waxing system. Um, it's working out really well. It's solving a lot of the, the heavy lifts that we have with the flat mop wax, I mean, with the regular wax and mops and strippers. And the custodians are really liking the machines that were made for them. That was with Pasco. They, they started that program. And um, it takes a lot of time out of the wax system for Great the time. custodians and a lot of labor and workman's comp things. So it's, you know, She's probably not going to brag too much, but it's pretty amazing to watch. I watched them do it at, at Lincoln um, Middle School. And you're cutting your labor in half, and you're cutting your waste at least by 30%. So you don't have the mops swinging all over the place, getting on the walls and uneven. Um, it's a really slick system, and they actually built every single one of them and delivered them. So we're hoping um, this is going to be really good. But I have seen it in action. It's pretty cool. The waxinator. I think it's really good that you guys are using <laughs> You're partnering with the other districts to learn. I mean, there's no need in reinventing everything. And if someone is doing something better than us, we have to really be open and embrace, you know, change and trying to do better about everything. I, I mean, it's not just in our instructional practices, but even in our operational. So. Agreed. So another thing we've been working on is getting feedback and, you know, having a continuous improvement in the, in the program. Uh, we feel like it's, it's a super important part of the process. And I was in a custodial, head custodian training a few months ago, and after they got done, been in my ear about pay and all of those things. Um, they had some, what I found is they had some really good ideas, like really good. I mean, these are, you know, head custodians that have been around for a long time, and one of them was like, oh, well, we do, you know, Centas does our, our, our mop head cleaning, which is like this, Sudden seemed like a huge deal. And the other one was like, oh, that's great. That, you know, they, had, they just have like some camaraderie within each other and have really good effective strategies. So that's really what um, we're looking to do. And of course, this is the feedback we received from this and subsequent meetings. I'm not going to go through every detail, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the stuff that we have talked about during the meeting. Um, and we wanted to set up some kind of method of getting some advisement um, from the custodial crew and especially effective custodial crews. So we're, we're talking about having an advisory committee of some sort. Um, feel like it would be really good to have, obviously, custodial representatives, principal representatives, and, um, of course, representatives from the custodial coordination office to <clears throat> do program evaluation, standardize our practices, um, standardize our equipment and products, the stuff that we've kind of just talked about and just find solutions. Um, we're very solution-based in my division, so you know we obviously are really good at identifying problems too, but we want to find solutions as well. So that's kind of what we've been focusing on. Uh, oversight and accountability. We, I think two, one of the first things we did last year was roll out an assignment checklist. So every custodian in the district has a one-page custodian assignment that shows them exactly where they should be, what they should be doing every hour of the day. Um, and it does a couple things. One, I feel like the communication from leadership to the custodian and on their expectations is very clear if it's all signed and they have their brakes on it, all that stuff. Uh, but it is also a method of accountability because if you go to whatever Miss Susie's classroom and Miss Susie's classroom is substandard, you'll know exactly who's responsible for cleaning that, um, and it allows us to have kind of expect you know inspect what we expect and things like that. So uh, I think that's been successful. It's it, I think it's improved the communication with the individual custodial teams, and we have collected those for every site. Mr. Rella, I've seen that form, and it's um, very much needed. But if the persons who are in charge to write on that and it hasn't been done, then don't call the custodian in for a meeting because you haven't done your part. I'm just saying, and this is close to my heart because I know what's not happening. 
in some of the schools. I have not been to all of the sites. So I think, you know, obviously accountability, you don't build that over a day. You don't build a program over a day. And largely we have not had a custodial I'm just being honest. We haven't had a custodial program that I've been able to find at all. So we're building this thing. I think that's the end game is to have, you know, a really good accountability system. So it's not just the head custodian and the plant manager or plant mechanic doing it. It's district level staff going in every single school once a month and looking at the facility and they'll know exactly who's in charge of what. I mean, that's kind of where we want to be. We're not going to be there tomorrow with three staff members necessarily. Um, but I think with some changes to how we operate, you know, we in you know following the PASCO model, you build up over a period of time. You build and I would I would highly recommend that that paper that the employee gets, it should be what do you call it? Um, so you can tear it off, and they would have a copy. And no, you're saying no? I think it should be a Google Doc or something they can access on right. the phone or something. We don't know about all that yes, technology. Yes, they do. They have phones. <laughs> Most of them have phones. That I'm saying what I think. Miss Certain is saying what she thinks. But, and you'll probably do what Certain says. But I'm, I'm knowing, I'm just, I'm just saying she is the chairperson. The chair, wait, let's stop. No, I'm not going to let that one go. Wait, no, 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 well, my we, colleague. We, I, no, I'm not. I'm going to. I'm not going to let that go because I'm the chair, and I am just facilitating our meeting. The chair does not get a wish list. Then and I'm not I asking that. Then that's what I want. Then. But I, she, no, but what I'm saying is when we when we make recommendations or we make suggestions, we want to become more efficient. And a paper-based model is not necessarily the most efficient way. And you may not be able to read what people can say, but if it's a phone or something that they can access on a device of some type, that may be more efficient. Then the manager has a copy of it, the employee has a copy. That's just my, that's what I'm thinking. But I'm not saying and, they don't have to do it that way. That, just Thank you, Ms. Certain. And I totally disagree with you on that because for people who understand all of that, I know how to talk on my phone. I don't know how to do all of that. So some of your custodians can't handle that, and those who can, do it what she's saying, of recommending. But I'm saying it would be helpful to have that so when meetings are called, you have, you can bring in your notebook with all of your stuff and your administrator scan as well. Technology is the key. Go that route. And I, you know, I think it's in the collective bargaining agreement now, like studies have to be given their assignment. Uh, we did pass some language during bargaining that strengthened that and really clarified exactly who's responsible for what, when they get it, how it's developed. Uh, but I think in general, yeah, I mean, that's, in my opinion, like a very basic thing, right? Like you have to know what you're responsible for. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure we address that, whether it's paper, whether it's online, however people need it. Um, but it's, you know, I know Thank a lot you. of, a lot of them have clip, you know, whatever the clipboards. Clipboard, yeah, <laughs> but they put all this stuff up. How, however it works, we just want to make sure they have what they need and we're being held accountable. Yep. See, that's, so folks will know, we, we, we don't always agree, she and I, and we oftentimes argue. Absolutely, and I love you for that, because I'm going to tell you what I think. Slides. We're almost there. I know everyone's getting hungry. No, I'm hungry. Um, so, and again, kind of, you know, the, the thought is to implement yellow, green, red strategy in terms of like, is it meeting satisfactions? Is it not? We want to use something similar to PASCO's rubric, which is, if you've looked at it, is extensive and it covers every little teeny thing, which is every little teeny thing is important. Um, so I think that's kind of the direction we're going. Um, we also have every school fill out summer schedules because that is our time when we're doing all the heavy lifting. We're pulling, you know, in order to strip and wax a, a tile floor in a classroom, you got to pull every piece of furniture out. So it has to be done when there's no students on site. It's our heavy lifting period, as Dr. McNeely mentioned. So they do provide us with, you know, every week what's happening, what, uh, you know, their the crew is responsible for. And it does a couple things. One, it's making sure that they're planning, which I have no doubt that every principal has knows exactly what the crew is doing every week, but I like to see it. And then also making sure we're on schedule to complete everything during the summer period. Um, 
board direction, I kind of put everything on here. I just didn't know. I think we've got some pretty good feedback um, for the most part on a lot of this stuff, but we've had a lot of different discussions internally. Um, whether you know we would ask for a plant manager type job description similar to what Pasco has, that's certainly something that, that our team would like. Um, just in general, the organizational structure sounds like you guys saw what I saw, does not work, so we'll, we'll look at that. Absenteeism, uh, one thing we didn't talk about is having like a sub pool. We talked about that as a, as a team, like having, if we know there's 25 out every day, we're not gonna have 25 out, sub pool, but having some employees we can dispatch and we have had a lot of issues where we had the entire school's custodial staff was out with COVID. That happened a bunch. And we're just, you know, we really, Teresa and Natasha, the team would go clean um, in the evening. But uh, that's something else that would be good to have, a, a, kind of like a SWAT team that we would just dispatch to the school to, that can help out. Um, scheduling, I think we got what we need on that custodial budgets. We'll be bring that during the budget process. Mr. Rella, for the custodial budgets, for the allocation, can you bring make that separate so we could um, the budget committee can see like the square foot? We can see the calculation. Like right now, I've, I've never seen that before. I saw the formula, and I've never seen the position, how it works out by school, and I've never seen the allocation for their supplies and expenditures. Um, so that was one thing. And then I was looking back, because I thought I remember reading the overtime that we spent. And seeing what we spent on overtime and contracting, it may, I think it is like the bus drivers have um, a group, uh, extra drivers, they're, they're, well, they're not, in theory, they have positions allocated to them where they can have a few extra so that they can cover absences, but, but because they've been understaffed, they've been used, but it may be um, uh, really, really valid to have some extra so that we could deploy out the schools that have absenteeism or to fill when they are, um, vacancies that's two the third thing the, in the comments from the um, the jam, the custodians about the head custodian the lead custodian having job duties to work I had written made the note of you know how much of their the percentage of their time is admin and what should actually be work because it's demoralizing if you have people just walking around being a taskmaster and so they gotta like help, help. They got to get, get the broom and the mop and the help. I mean, like for me, when I work, that's what I do. I, I like, I'm the leader by example. I don't mind doing, I, and you, I've told you my bookkeeping analogy. You know, I could do the bookkeeper job or the, the account clerk, and I could do above me. But I think it's really important for the person who's the leader to lead by example. They're, I mean, they're, they, they got a title, and I know, but they still should have some responsibility for doing work. And that must be an issue for the employees to say that and it be on me. And I think that is something we, those three things I think that in addition to the schedule and all that stuff, but I think that needs to really be looked at because we don't want to just have people head and leave, not doing any work. Yep. No, Ms. Mrs. Uh, certain Mr. Shellnut was a huge example as an administrator at his previous school you could pass down that street and see him out there picking up trash and, and early in the morning. And I often would ask my son, who's, why is the principal out there doing that? But he showed to his employees what can be done and how you can work together. And I always think back to David out there picking up all that stuff on that campus and not saying to a custodian, you go do it, okay? I had to bring that up because Mrs. Certain mentioned it as to what she, but I wanted to just get down to the very bottom thing. I think Ms. Costomo might have provided all of this stuff for the um, bus people. I'd like to see the same thing done for our custodians, and they don't have a hub like we went to transportation, so maybe it could be done at Duval. But I think it's important that we show this group of employees how important that they are. I, I agree, Dr. McNeil, and you could ask the uniform people, those vendors that we deal with, like we do the transportation, ask them for donations, but anyway. So, Mr. Rella, I think you've received a lot of feedback from us and direction. As you said, do you have, um, you need any other board direction or is there anything we didn't think of? 
or that we didn't interject when you were you two were going I, through? I, I think we I think we we got what we needed for the most part. I think we need to come back with a little bit more specific of a plan. <clears throat> I think today today was really about kind of laying it out there and like talking about the end game where we want to be and talking about how we think we should get there. Um, obviously, it's going to take people. So um, I think I think I, I appreciate the board's input. Obviously, it's a major area of focus for my division. So we're excited about it. But I think we did receive the input. And we'll bring back budgetary stuff to the budget committee and board during the normal approval process. If you start with your advisory board, I like that idea. Because when you make people feel good, they'll clean all day and do anything for you. But we, you, you got a lot of people in the schools who have great ideas. Just make them feel, you know, welcome. And I, t I promise you, it'll turn around. Yep. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry I got in the way of lunch, but that's okay. Anyone else have any, um, any other comments? I'm, I'm a questions. I don't think you have any other anything else. Thank you so much. You have any citizen input? Nothing. All right, we're adjourned. We'll see you back at six tonight. Um, and I, I will just want to tell you about I had asked Kim and those that to collect the microphones so they could be charged since we were going long that we would have a set that would be start charging before we left out of here. Yes, ma'am.